And first of all, I want to thank uh, Al Amen, the best manager in the world. He's the fucking champion of the world! Miguel Mai! Madonna and Stevenson, piece of shit. No, I think Rosado good boy. Rosado is a good boy. I've become a massive international superstar, it's as simple as that. I eat your ass all alive, you bitch! Scared of the real man! I'll fuck you till you love me, faggot! I'm going to physically shoot David Hay. He fucking glossed me. He glossed me. Derek, who down? I'm Shannon Bridge. I'm hard to kill. I'm the black team with the ball. I'm hard to fucking kill. Well, I believe Christopher can take a punch. I'm very good at math and looking at a fighter and seeing what his abilities are. I can't see that Golovkin has anything like Christopher's speed, his power, his punching ability, his hell speed. His foot movement, I don't see that, from a calculating point of view, I don't see that he has anything like that. So then it's going to come down to heart. You know, I spoke to Joe Gallagher, they don't want to fight Carl Frampton. And the bottom line is, you know, no disrespect to Prosper Anchor, these guys aren't good enough to face Carl Frampton. I'm the best heavyweight champion in the world. I'm half WPC with me. I'm undefeated champion. Undisputed champion. I want who next? He's got my Dino Rybo nucleic acid. On this student heavyweight champion world, who next? I love boxing sound. It's as simple as that. Welcome everyone to the 105th edition of the Nuthouse Podcast brought to you by BoxSalm.com. I'm your host Andy Patterson. With me today I've got a small panel of guests. I've got Alex Morris, Donnie Baseball, Steve Wellens and Kurt Ward. Uh, no Adam Smith this week and we don't know what's happened to Dave the Hater. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we've had a few fights come out of uh, our poop shoots since Thursday. Um, figuratively, not literally obviously. Meanwhile Donnie's probably now skin and bone after wanking himself stupid during that can fight last night. But uh, as you know he is with us. Uh, but once again, gentlemen, you know the headlines have been dominated somewhat by poor judging. At least three from America, one from England, and uh, one from Denmark. And I think some are also saying that the scorecards in the Lee Korobov fight were slightly off. Now, um, I haven't managed to catch all the fights. Obviously, it's been really, really busy this week for fights. Um, where we're going to start off? We'll start off with the HBO card. Obviously, Amir Khan dominating victory against uh, Devon Alexander. Um, First four or five rounds, it looked like, you know, it was just going to be the same thing over and over again. But, you know, I thought she can start to slow down slightly. I think I had it 119, 10, what was it, 109, 108. I think I gave that under the eighth round anyway. Um, one thing, Donnie, I'll just hand it straight over to you, mate, because obviously you are the big can uh, cocksucker here. Um, <laughs> one, two, two things actually that, that, that I take from, from this version 3.0 or can actually, you say it's 2.0, I say it's 3.0. One, his balance is far, far better, I think, in my personal opinion. But the flaw is still there. He's still wide open when he goes on the attack. And B, he still leaves that chin exposed sometimes when he does attack as well. Do you agree with that? Yeah, he got hit with a few shots last night. But, I mean, it's boxing. And he didn't get hit with that many of them. Um, the thing is, is that, yeah, when he does go in for that attack and he does have a tendency to stay in there maybe a second too long and he, he gets tagged if somebody tries to punch with him. Uh, but, um, you know, it, like I said, that, that's boxing. I mean, you're going to get, you're going to get punched. You're going to get punched in the face. Like, I mean, it's, it's a pretty normal part of the sport that the key is, is just being able to, to, you know, parry it with your gloves so that it doesn't land clean or roll with it or whatever. So that, you know, basically you're not taking a flush one right on the point of the chin. Uh, I think that fighting southpaws is actually better for Khan, uh, because the punch that he's most over to is that left hook and, um, you know, he didn't have to worry about that coming from the lead hand against the southpaw. So, um, so in general, I mean, uh, the, the, the performance was dazzling. Um, I mean, I think we all thought he would beat Alexander. I think the opinion last week on the podcast was unanimous, but I don't think, uh, well, first, I don't think anyone's done that to Alexander before. Uh, even Porter, who beat him, beat him by, I think it was a couple of 116, 112s and a 115, 113. 
Um, but nobody ever blanked him on the scorecards. I mean, that's I had it 119-109, but I think I also gave him the eighth round like you did, Andy. Uh, that 118-110, that was just an abomination, speaking of bad scoring. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, in general, I mean, I just... Uh, I think that was probably one of his finest performances, and um, uh, I liked the way he he moved. He you know kept using that lateral movement to make Alexander essentially chase him around. Uh, he really his footwork I thought was the biggest improvement that he made. In addition to coming in, you know, when he comes in, coming in with his hands up and then trying to get out quickly, uh, he still sometimes drops his hands. But in general, I mean, like relative to the con that we saw two years ago, four years ago, I mean just light years better uh, above and beyond where he was. And um, you know, credit to Virgil Hunter. It shows that he knows how to build a fighter. And, Donnie, can I just say, did you think that he looked massive in the ring as well next to Alexander? Absolutely. Well, he, put on, he, he, he put on 16 pounds from, from the weigh-in. He's, he's really filled out of the weight. It's unbelievable yeah. how much he's filled yeah, out. A lot, yeah. of us, a lot of us said, oh, well, he will, he'll move up to welterweight and he's going to get smacked around. Uh, you know, if, if he can't take a punch at Junior Welter, how's he going to take it at Welter? Well, he he seems to. I mean, I know he hasn't been in the ring with massive hitters, but I mean, still though, I mean, he just he just looks stronger at the weight. Like he just looks like he could take it a little bit better. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely thought um, that he I mean he really looks like a true welterweight. Uh, and as you probably heard earlier this week, he said he wouldn't rule out eventually later on in his career moving up to 154. Um, that might be a step too far, but I think. I think he's really at the right weight right now. He looks he looks really good. Um, the thing that I find interesting is if uh, we don't have that that fight that uh, we don't mention, but between fighter A and fighter B in May, um, you know, I, I think Khan's pretty much a shoe in. Then if it's not if we don't get that fight, but if we do get that fight, it'll set up an interesting situation in September um, because of the Ramadan issue. You know, basically. Uh, Khan will have to choose between uh, making moolah or pleasing Allah, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but I don't I don't know uh, I don't know yeah what how that's going to work. So I think he's really praying that fight doesn't get made. Well, according to Khan anyway, I mean he's made his statement. He says he's earned his fight. He's sorry, he's earned his shot at Mayweather. Um, does anybody actually believe that even though off the back of that performance? He still deserves to get, or he de- is deserving of that Mayweather fight. Well, it's 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 not really about what you deserve. I don't think. I mean, it's about what you negotiate. I mean, yeah. that's an old saying. And I think Khan is in the position now. You know, I mean, there's not a lot of options for Floyd to be honest. I mean, I know everyone's talking about the the Pacquiao fight, but I've always said, I don't know, I'm bored of that. That's both of them are idiots in that. For that fight, but I think you know if, you, if you're Mayweather and you're looking at op- opponents, I think Amir Khan is a really a good opponent. You know he brings name, he brings fans, and I think he's a, a, after coming off that win. I mean, people say you know you need to come off a decent win to fight Floyd, and if you look at Floyd, he, he fights guys who come in off good wins. You know Ortiz beating Berto, for instance, Guerrero doing the same thing. So I mean they got him for beating Berto. Why can't Khan get him for beating Alexander? In my opinion. The main thing is well. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, on you go. I was just going to say, is me. I was, I was, I was disappointed with uh, Dave Alexander. I mean, I know he's, he's saying he, 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 he was beaten by the better man, but I don't know if it was maybe just the fact that it was his, uh, the speed that was giving him, giving him problems. But it just didn't seem. I mean, obviously as well, we can't attack him. Why not just pop at the jab? It doesn't matter if you're landing the jab. Just get it out there. Make Can think twice about attacking you. Just kind of keep flicking it out. Keep flicking it out. But he just didn't seem to want to do it or couldn't do it. Whatever, whatever, whatever one it was. I think. I'd- I think his uh, Khan's control of the range really, because Khan was able to come in, hit him with a jab, and get out before he. I mean, if you notice, Devin did try to use a jab. I mean, yet not enough. Obviously, he gave up on it, but early on he did try to use it, but he just wasn't hitting him. I mean, Khan was actually moving his head last night too, which is another thing I noticed. And I think there was another thing too in the fifth round. Um, they had one hand free, and like Khan was like using his right hand to bang Alexander to the body, you know, in a clinch. And I was like, wait, what's this? Like. We never seen him do this before. I mean, he really is incorporating some new elements, and um, I mean, I, I think he's he's still growing as a fighter. And then this 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 union with Virgil Hunter really seems to be doing him a whole lot of good. Um, and uh, with regards to whether he's earned Floyd, I mean, I I, I personally, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I know I'm a little bit biased. I'm a big fan, but I mean, who else is he going to fight really if it's not Manny? Um, 
you know, it's. I mean, that's well, pretty much the nice only logical option fight. Nice, nice look. If he isn't going to get get the Mayweather fight, if he doesn't get the Pacquiao fight, then you've obviously got the Thurman fight sitting there begging to be made. Well, the Brook fight. Or are you talking about Khan? Yeah, I'm talking about Khan here. I mean, obviously, I, mean, I, I really don't think. I mean, you know, you, you've got you've got a situation here between uh, Brook and Khan. Khan saying he'll need to accept his demands. Brook saying he's a champion, which is fair enough. But I, I would like to see I like to see Khan Thurman first. You know, because I, I, I think as well as I think Brook's going to have a he's got a mandatory due shortly as well. Yeah, I think he's getting a fight in, in March first, isn't he? Before he takes on you know a, a bigger name that he wants. But Joe Joe Dan against Kevin, Kevin Busier, I think he's going to be mandatory. That's, yeah. that's looking the most likely, isn't it? But I think in terms of Alexander, I know people. You know, I think Khan is one of those guys that even if he fought Floyd and beat Floyd, he'd still be shit on by some people, and they'll just say <laughs> Floyd's shot. We got to give him his credit. Look, Alexander, you can say what you want about him. Guys like Bradley and Sean Porter, they bullied him. Khan actually outboxed him. Khan isn't the, a, a Timothy Bradley or a Sean Porter, a, a, you know, a roughhouse guy who's gonna, you know, get inside and really bully him all the way. But, you know, he couldn't cope with that. He, he outboxed him, and look, look at the guys Alexander's been been in with. He's been in with Maidana, who gets a lot of praise after his Mayweather performances. Matisse, who's getting a lot of hype from certain people. Neither of them could, you know, even if you think uh, Matisse beat him, it was a close fight. Look what. Khan just done to him. He beat him easily. He made Alexander, you know, at Showtime are calling him a world class welterweight. Well, he made him look like a bit of a bum, to be honest, in fairness. And, you know, you got to give Khan credit for that. I think Virgil Hunter's, you know, people are saying oh, he's, he's made the wrong move. I think after the Diaz fight, you know, when Hunt was outside the ring and he, he didn't seem to be giving him the right advice. But I think now it's, you're starting to see it pay dividends. I mean, he was constantly telling him, you know, in between rounds, stay focused, you know, meaning. You know, Amir has got a history of, you know, letting it, you know, slip and he get dragged into a fight. And by him keep telling him, stay focused. It doesn't, it's not about looking fantastic every time or winning a war. It's about winning the fight because especially with the Mayweather fight, you know, apparently right there. And I think that he's worked well with him so far and he, he, he keeps him grounded. And, you know, I say last week, we haven't heard much of Khan talking about Mayweather where every other fight before that it's Mayweather Mayweather instead of the opponent and I think that's down to Virgil Hunter to be honest yeah I mean I think as well Stephen Alex bringing his in just now but uh, you know obviously the, the signs of frustration I was under were, were quite clear I felt you know, especially his corner anyway I mean you heard these was saying Kevin Cunningham he was getting really irate with him but it's still the same thing as I was surprised that actually you know how hit up and in his ear that Virgil Hunter was with, with, with Khan. I mean, Khan looked like at times he was enjoying himself from there. He was kind of showboating slightly, you know, kind of talking to, to Alexander and Clinches and stuff. But I was I was very surprised actually, and maybe this is something to do with, with, with Khan maybe trying to look himself a wee bit more kind of exciting and stuff because I felt that under Hunter he was a born fighter, but last night it was absolutely different. He wasn't clinching as much. He wasn't like maybe three four punch combination and falling into a clinch. Like you heard Jim Watt maybe mention a couple of times last night, that's what he should be doing if he, if he falls in it or falls short with his punches. Uh, I just felt it was a complete and utter domination and world class performance from Khan, actually. There wasn't much careless whispers from Virgil, which disappointed no. me. I was looking it was forward all passion. to them. <laughs> yeah. It was pure raw passion from Hunter there last night, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it was, it was a better fight than most people expected, wasn't it? I mean, a lot of people were saying before, and it was going to be a bit of a clinch fest and it was going to be a boring fight, but Khan never allowed it to become that type of fight. His speed was just phenomenal. I, I was actually very impressed with him, his movement and his ability to stay restrained and box with control. It just meant that he didn't offer Alexander a chance. And I think it was more to do with Khan's offensive abilities rather than Alexander just didn't know what to do in there. Up until, it wasn't until about the eighth round when he started landing the right hook. And even though Khan was lunging in at times early on and he was susceptible to the right hook, Considering his past flaws and the very high level of opponent he was facing, as Kurt said, you know, Alexander's no fool, even though he looked like one in there last night. You know, this was a masterful display, I thought, and, and he should be commended for it, because if, if you look at the trajectory of Khan's career, I mean, I remember seeing him fighting the King's Hall against Laszlo Komyathi, I think it was, on ITV in 2006, and even though he had potential, it's just remarkable to think how he's progressed since then to headline in US TV cards. Now Showtime, you know, pretty much and on HBO cards, the highest you can get. And I just think Khan's at his peak now. And I think he deserves a shot at Mayweather as much as anybody else does. And it, as Kurt said, it depends what he brings to the table. But I think um, he deserves the Mayweather shot. And I think he'd beat Brooke as well if they fought. 
Alex, do you believe that? Has he earned that shot? Some people I speak to say he's not earned it yet. I mean, at, at present, he's probably made himself known to be a, a very competent welterweight at world level. But you're talking about the elite level here. Has um, he earned that shot yet? I think he has earned the shot, yeah, definitely. I mean, he's probably the one name at the moment that people would probably say, yeah, that's the guy we want to see Mayweather fight, you know, excluding fighter B. Uh, you know... It's it's everything else that he's bringing to it. He's bringing this intrigue of his speed. He's bringing the intrigue of his of his you know ability and his talent that we've seen throughout all the years. You know, at the Olympics, one of the youngest ever Olympians winning the silver medal and things like that. He's bringing all that to the table as well as his you know big fan base. And that ultimately matters more to uh, Mayweather is how much money it can make and you know how many people he can sell it to. I think that. You know, a lot of the problem was is that Khan was thinking that he was owed and due that fight 18 months ago. He was saying that I deserve the Mayweather fight. I should be already fighting Mayweather, and that pissed a lot of people off. That really put pe- uh, you know people off of Khan. He was very arrogant, very presumptuous. But then he he got a very good win against Colazzo, and then a very good win last night. I thought he demonstrated that his speed is a very lethal factor. Basically, his speed entirely negated anything that Alexander did. Whenever Khan wanted to lead and go on the offensive, he'd be landing three punches before Alexander could, you know, clock him back with anything else. If he, if Khan wanted to go on the counter, his counter his counters were just a lot faster than anything uh, Devon could do. You know, Devon would step in, and before he could dart back out, he's been clocked with a left hook or a right hook. And, you know, it, it was very impressive, but, you know, you've got to look at it as... It's, as a point of styles as well. I mean, Devon Alexander, he tries to box, he tries to win his way just, uh, again, by controlling range and just by boxing and jabbing. And you can't do that against someone who's faster than you. You can't... You're not let his hands to, go. Yeah, he has to let his hands go and, and try and smother Khan and stop him from being able to dart and throw all these you know, multiple combinations. And when he tried, he looked foolish. He tried to go in and maybe do a clinch, but he'd get clocked a couple of times on the way in. As you know, as you've already said, he just looked foolish in there last night, Alexander did. And I think Khan looked very impressive. Um, I still don't think Khan beats Floyd. I still don't think Khan beats Brooke. Because the elephant in the room, again, is Khan's chin. He will get chinned by Brooke, and I think he might even get chinned by Floyd. It depends if Floyd has got the power now at this age and the will to throw punches hard enough to stop Khan in his tracks. If he can stop Khan in his tracks and, you know, with well-timed, well-placed right, lead right hands, then Khan's going on his ass. He did look massive last night, but has all of his chin problems before been due to the fact that he was, you know, as he claimed, uh, dehydrated and drained and stuff like that or has he just got a really piss poor chin and uh, we're going to find that out soon I'm not going to Donnie with this question then but Steve do you think we, we, we can range speed probably even well you heard them um, uh, he made 16 pounds over the 147 limit last night do you think he's got all the tools now to kind of you know physically um, you know he's probably matured into a, into a man now I think he's got his man strength about him has he now got all the tools to beat Mayweather He's got the tools as much as he's ever going to, but no, I mean, Mayweather's just a phenomenal proposition for anybody, isn't he? I mean, there's the the world class, there's the elite, and then there's sort of Mayweather. I think his speed will give Mayweather trouble. Mayweather's like these sort of slow-footed, plodding types, you know, the Madonnas, the way Canelo turned out to be, Guerrero, Ortiz. He seems to fight the same guys with the same sort of formula. He had trouble for the first four rounds against Zab Judah with his speed, Shane Mosley had troubled him for the first couple of rounds with his speed. And that was a quicker Floyd as well. But exactly, and the thing was, they faded as the fight went on. They're traditional fading fighters. Khan showed last night that even though in the past he's been a four or five round fighter, he looks like the type of guy who can sustain a decent level for the full 12 rounds. Now, doing it against Devin Alexander and a bit of a shell of De- Devin Alexander and against Mayweather are two different things, but... I think his speed makes him a very live opponent for Mayweather, and I think he'll make it a lot more interesting than other opponents, if not beat Mayweather, because he won't beat Mayweather. Steve, this is just a hunch, though, mate. I'm just kind of like you know, going by your undertones of what you just said there. Are you trying to say that Mayweather's cherry-picking his opponents? And I would never especially mention about all those, but especially mention all, all those fighters you just mentioned there, about all having the same problem, you know, kind of <laughs> flat-footed and stuff, you know? Uh, yeah, that was my weekly think, <laughs> <laughs> just on the spot. Yeah, of course, he's cherry-picking his opponents. <laughs> that being the case, then, Donnie, will Floyd cherry-pick 
can for his next fight. Obviously, he's looking. I don't know. I don't know how much we want to put into this this nonsense about May second about fighter A, fighter B. Fighter A's called him out. Fighter B's now apparently accepted that challenge, um, which we won't get into just now. But uh, bullshit that goes with it. Yep, or as well because you know what it's like. Or the or the flood stands and the black tards and that sent to kind of get out there out their fucking cree about it. But Donny does does for Floyd now cherry pick can or does he gonna just say no fuck that I don't need that. No, I, I think he, I don't think he wants to fight a, a a real young hungry lion like Amir Khan. Uh, I really don't. I mean, I don't, I think I think I really would not be surprised to see him try to pull up, be like, "Yo, man, like Khan got Garcia problems," and like like fight Danny Garcia and pull him up to one forty seven. Or I wouldn't be surprised to see him fight um, Miguel Cotto, um, you know, to try to fuck up. Because remember now, Canelo wants to steal. The uh, the May second Cinco de Mayo weekend date. He wants to steal that date, and which, which Floyd dared them to do, and he they hadn't done it. Yeah, and he says he's going to fight Cotto on that date, and um, and now Bob Arum and Oscar De La Hoya, uh, Arum being the promoter currently for on a fight by fight basis for Miguel Cotto, and Oscar being the uh, promoter for uh, Canelo Alvarez. You know, the two of them together uh, have said that they. Think that that date should be reserved for a Mexican fighter fighting a big fight for the Mexican people, and they want to take that date. And so I think what they might be trying to do is to force Floyd into fighting Manny Pacquiao. <laughs> but I'm just trying to explain myself here. Uh, I, I think, I think be, wait, no, I, th- I think Matt because was I think that's the only opponent Floyd could face that could maybe displace. Um, Canelo, because here's the thing that people have to understand. It's been a lot of people in the media talking about this, and they have no fucking idea as to how the hell pay-per-view works. The way the pay-per-view works among cable and satellite providers in the United States is this. They pick one pay-per-view event to show on the pay-per-view channel that is allocated for that, right? I mean, there might be like one of those smaller ones, like the integrated sports pay-per-view, whatever, but the main pay-per-view channel... They just pick one. The networks will not air two separate boxing pay-per-views. I think occasionally they have aired a boxing versus UFC because they figured they're different markets. But but essentially they won't air a bo- boxing versus boxing, which is why... But didn't they do that with Canelo and Chavez? Last... Nope. No, because Canelo fought on regular Showtime that, that weekend. Yep. And, uh, and so basically... That's what pissed Richard Schaefer off so badly that led to Golden Boys falling out with HBO back then was that they couldn't get Canelo versus uh, Jose Cito Lopez yeah. on pay-per-view because Chavez stole the date. And uh, they were like, well, who's going to sell more? And the, the, the various you know satellite and cable networks looked at it and they're like, all right, the pay-per-view we're going with is Chavez versus Martinez. And that's the one they chose. And so Canelo had to fight on regular showtime. Now, truth be told, both arenas that weekend sold out. Uh, they'll, you know, in terms of the live gate, uh, or came very close to it. And um, and you know, and and the rate and the fight on Showtime did very good ratings. And the fight for Chavez Martinez, I think, did four hundred fifty thousand pay per view, which was very respectable. So I mean, you know, it's uh, it's not like the worst thing in the world to have two boxing events going head to head. You know, last night, I think uh, I know that Khan's crowd at the MGM had about eight thousand. I don't know what the one... 7,758, I believe, the final tally was. And do you know what the one was for Bradley? I don't know. It was, a sh- it was a sellout. I don't know what the arena holds there, though, but it was a sellout for what I hear. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so, I mean, between that, I mean, you had two big boxing events, uh, you know, selling out probably fifteen, sixteen thousand 16,000 seats, uh, you know, between them. Uh, that's, that's pretty good. It's a good weekend for boxing, you know, in Las Vegas. That's great. So, I mean... Uh, yeah, you have to temper your expectations when you have a big show across across the strip. So, um, but yeah, no, I mean it, it'll be a, it'll be a complicated thing. But I mean, I just don't own, I don't know that Mayweather, maybe Mayweather Khan could do it, maybe. But I think that basically, in order for Mayweather to have that May second date, I think he might have to fight fighter B. Otherwise, uh, it might be um, you know he or maybe Mayweather Khan could do it, but. It can't uh, be that fight though, because it says you know, Fighter B has got a contract with HBO, so uh, HBO then going to say to Canelo and Cotto, listen, can you move the date? 
because we didn't want to have a double pay per view mm-hmm. on the same night. Because what, whatever's going to happen, f- uh, fighter A and fighter B, it needs to be on their respective pay per view mm-hmm. platforms. If you listen to Floyd as well, he says that the fight has to happen on Showtime. Pacquiao has to accept less money than was offered before now because he's lost to Marquez, he's lost to Bradley as well that he included, and his pay per view numbers are terrible now. There's all this stipulation. Now people can say, oh, he wants to fight now, but he's going to offer. You know, he, he's got making his demands already, and I just don't see Pacquiao accepting the demands because people can talk about the pay per view numbers all they want. Pacquiao's still making good money, you know, fighting who he's fighting. You know, we got to be real about it. Anyways, we've kind of went off topic there about the about the fights. Keith Furman um, went the distance last night. You know, one twenty one oh seven across all three scorecards against Leonard Bundu. Um, I th- I don't know what it was. I think maybe we slightly underrated Bundu last week. Maybe underrated his toughness, or maybe we slightly overrated Thurman and his punching ability. Uh, I don't know what it was, but uh, basically after that fight, Thurman, you know, I think the booze after after the fight kind of got to him uh, some sort of way. I, I think it was strange because Bundu was was hurt in that first round. His his leg looked like it had gone, and Thurman didn't seem to want to jump on him, which is surprising because he is known as that you know puncher who goes for the the kill instinct. He seemed to like, you know, want to do the rounds, which I don't know if that's the case, but that's what it seemed like to me, which is strange because, you know, maybe he, th- he didn't think much of Bundu and he thought he could get him out there in, you know, four or five rounds. He wanted to do a few, and then he found out Bundu was a lot tougher, very awkward, you know, and he won comfortably, but it was one of those where he wins, but he he doesn't his stock doesn't really rise out of it at all. I mean, most were expecting an easy night from Bundu, you know, but he's he's tough and he showed that, but. Yeah, I mean, I just think Thurman should have planted his feet more and, you know, really landed some big shots. He, he seemed to be moving a bit too much for me, and I think the crowd were booing, which was unfair because, like I said, Bundu came to fight, he's a tough guy. But, I just, yeah, I just wanted to see him, you know, plant his feet more, land more power shots because Bundu's not a puncher at all, and he, he's, he's 40 years old, he's smaller, and he, he couldn't really hurt Thurman. So I thought Thurman, being the big puncher, would have, you know, gone for the kill a lot more. But, you know, he's still. You've got good experience there, I'd say. It's, you know, it's a difficult thing because I don't think hardly any of the Vegas crowd there knew who Leonard Bundu is, you know, what he's sort of accomplished. I mean, yeah, we know him quite well because he's come over and he's, you know, he beat uh, Frankie Gavin and that and um, he also beat Lee Purdy as well, wasn't he? And he, he looked good, he looked very durable, but I don't think anyone really knew him over in America. So for Keith Thurman, who's supposed to be this big knockout artist, knockout expert who's blasting every bastard out there away and then for him to go 12 rounds with this Euro bum, as a lot of Americans would call him uh, you know, I can understand why some of them boo him but you know, it's a case more of ignorance I think on their part um, I think that if you have someone else who's like say Golovkin went 12 rounds with uh, not Murray because Murray's sort of uh, noted as being you know, he's a bit more well known in America but say uh, Golovkin went 12 rounds with Adama or something, do you think they'd boo him? There was simply shit on him anyway. I mean, look, look at the look at the comments made when he made wait, it was nine rounds with uh, what was the Zimbabwe guy's name again? Uma, remember Uma, uh, the yeah. Ugandan? Sorry, the, the remember him? Remember he got shit for uh, going nine rounds with him? And that was that was Uma coming up from like middleweight. Oh, but sure, they boo them if there hasn't been anybody stretched out after the first <laughs> couple of rounds. Yeah. yeah, some crowds like that, but I think for Furman, I think that Maidana fight would be a really good fight, and I think that's the type he needs. If you know, he needs a name who people respect, and if you can, you know, really do a good job on someone like Maidana, I think that can get him the bigger fights that he wants. He, he's like he needs that that big fight. He's he's done a good job against lower level guys, but he needs that fight to get people his you know, attention. I don't know what it is about Thurman. I think that I could just see Madonna folding him. I don't know what it is. He, I'm not saying he's a quitter. That's obviously too strong. But he goes on the, on his bike for a reason. What is the reason? You know, maybe, he's, he, maybe he's preserving gas. I know he had a shoulder yeah. surgery. He had. Uh, that's why he's been out the ring for so long. Maybe he was trying to preserve himself. I think. Well, I, I was kind of thinking that as well. Though I actually heard the. The, the post-fight interview in, in the ring, I maybe felt as maybe they were looking to get the 12 rounds because he's inactivity. But he then heard Dan Birmingham saying, just before the 11th or the 12th round or something, saying, is, listen, this this guy might be old, but he's a, he's a tough character. Just you know, just don't take any risks with him. Just see out the fight. I think they're maybe just happy to get the 12 rounds under the mm. bill. Well, I know some of the American fans were calling him Bundu and all this type of stuff, but that was just because they didn't know who he was. I'm actually mm. glad. I'm glad Bundu got his shot. 
Mm-hmm. You know, this guy's paid his dues. He's won well on the road a few times. He's got his big payday, which he was thoroughly deserved. I mean, I know he only landed 62 punches in the entire fight and only two punches in some of the rounds, according to the stats. But he's a game guy and he didn't disgrace himself. And I'm sure he knows he'll never, ever fight at that level again. He did the best that he could. Um, regarding the knockdown, I thought he was in. The, he got caught out in the transition between Orthodox and Southpaw, which often happens. He was totally square-footed. He was switching from one to the other, I think, and he got caught out foot-wise, and Thurman landed the left hook and dropped him, and I was surprised at that. I didn't think Thurman, even though Thurman's a big puncher, I didn't think he was going to get him out of there, and after that, the fight pretty much went to typo, I thought it was, and Thurman showed good patience, really, good boxing skills, and his power is sort of sitting ominously in the background at the moment, rather than you know, it's not in the forefront of his no, game. It's not his main feature, is it? Yeah, he's not throwing a lot of power shots at the moment. He's more controlled and he's a bit more of a thinking man's puncher. You know, I'm happy to watch him go the distance at world level rather than sitting on the shelf waiting for a defining fight like someone like Peter Quillen who's sitting in the crowd, you know, with his, sitting on his hands when he should be having, having fights at a decent level. So at least Thurman's active, like I always say, is the main thing. Talking about Peter Quillen, I want to mention him later on just between that Andy Lee fight. Sorry, Alex, when you go, mate. I was just going to say, based on the the performances last night of Thurman and Khan, who wins? Khan. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, this this version of Khan, if he boxed the instructions, I could see him winning it. Um, it's just a game. Yeah, do you not that's think the that Thurman is. would just chin him though? First well, punch. You know, again, as I say, I think you know this version of Can here. Right, if you've got three, four punch combination, if he's if he's willing to grab hold, right, and not do what he did last night. I mean, Alexander isn't really like, the greatest puncher. I think um, you no, know, that Arango knockout basically maybe overhyped him slightly in his punching power. Um, you know, Can was dropping his left hand sometimes after about the eighth round. There, he was getting chinned a few times with the uh, with, with, with the right hook. Didn't seem to phase him or shake him up in any sort of way, so I think Alexander's power is slightly overrated. Um, but at the same time, as well as I think Can will box the instructions, he'll get in, he'll get out, and uh, I just don't think Thurman could match him for hand speed, and do, he might think, struggle to get that hook in. Do you think Khan could hurt Thurman? No, I, you know, I think he's got enough to make him to keep him honest. I just don't think he's got that. It's just look at the way he attacks. He actually steps in. He, st- he steps in square with, with, with his punches, so he's not really punching through the hip. He's just kind of like basically kind of it's more like hand speed, kind of like basically square on. So he's not really getting the, the full the full uh, right of his power through his shots. You've got to remember as well, Char- uh, Chavez was doing pretty good against um, Thurman for the first four or five rounds in their fight as well before Thurman took over. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Khan plants his feet enough to hurt them, which is understandable. He doesn't fl- want to plant his feet because he get knocked out. It's, it's more flurries, isn't it? But the, yeah. because of the speed of it, you know. I mean, I think Khan is a, a good body puncher, and he, you know, he's hurt quite a few guys to the bodies. You know, I remember the Lamont Peterson one, or you know, for instance, and and, and, and the Maidana one. But I think if he definitely, I think he punches harder than you know, he'd, he probably his record suggests. But he, I think he he doesn't want to stay in the pocket too long, so he's not. It's going to be more flurries, and you know, it's going to catch judges' eyes as well, especially when he's landing three or four punches in you know seconds. Moving down that card, Jamel Charlo had a three round stoppage against Lenny Botta from Italy. Uh, guys, this was an IBF eliminator. Now I checked the, the rankings this morning when I watched it. Uh, I'm saying to myself, how the hell? This guy, Lenny Botter, got into a top five ranking with IBF because, in all honesty, he's probably only a domestic level fighter. Um, I don't know how many you saw it. Uh, Donnie, I know you, see it, you saw it, mate. Destruction was probably the only word that you could, you could say. I mean, the punch itself was about, you couldn't really see it. I thought it was like one of these sneaky ones. Let me put a feedback off your mic there as well, Donnie. I don't think so. Oh, yeah. Anyways, give me a thought on the fight. I'm getting a bit of feedback, though. Yeah, I might have to sign off for something. Am I echoing? Yep. Damn it, alright. I don't know why, but I'll, I'll I'll be back. Right, no worries. Okay, Arnie, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, that being the case, then, as I say, Charlo, I, don't, I think I think the number one to number two spot with IBF is currently vacant, so I'm assuming he's going to get one of those two, two positions. positions probably get, probably get a box, box off. off. Donnie. Donnie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Getting feedback, getting feedback off, feedback you, again. off you again. Damn it! All right, sorry. Mute. Go and sit in Thank the corner, you. Donny. 
Just because Khan <laughs> won, it's not need to take the piss on the podcast. <laughs> And uh, I, t- I, d- I don't know if I mean he's just sort of Steve. I knew you were watching it as we we're talking this before the podcast. Abner Mares was involved in a quite a lot of fun, lot of scrap against Jose Ramirez. Renew- people will me- remember Ramirez fighting Lomachenko in his pro debut. Um, Ramirez down in the first, third, and fifth rounds. Good little scrap, but at the end of the day as well as Mares, just you know, his typical style is the bore forward and just punch the hell out of Ramirez. Did anybody, did anybody see this fight? Yeah, I, I was watching it actually on the laptop there as as you were talking. I had the sound down, I'm assuming. Ramirez hurt his ear or something. Was that the, was he was did he quit on his stool or something like that? He I seemed don't, to be I, don't know. I, I, I kinda got the impression that the referee was kinda maybe like saying to the saying the corner horse and you need to think about pulling this guy out because he was taking up a hell of a beating. He was. He was taking a beating. Mares was starting to wing away on him and it was an impressive performance, by an impressive finish by Mares. But the thing was, even though it was a good fight, Mares for me hasn't learned his lessons. No, because he got Ramirez rocking a little bit, and he just went left hook happy, one after another after another, just like he did with Johnny Gonzalez. And Ramar, uh, Ramirez was throwing a few back, and he was catching him with a few right and left hooks. Now, obviously, he hadn't got the power or the the freshness to compete at that pace for the full ten rounds, but. He was the thing was Mares was wide open once he he smelt blood. Uh, it'll make for exciting fights, but he's an accident waiting to happen unless he can try and um, sort that out. I think uh, as well. I, I don't know if you heard Jim Jim Watts coming through in this fight. Now, I know Mares is boxed at you know very good levels an amateur, but you know boxing is not what I would actually class after Mares is. I think Mares is a more kind of like <coughs> forward fighter and wants to go to war with it. You know the, the way Watt was talking there last night is this is this should be the right way that Mares is approaching this fight because you, you know no sorry this is this is the way that uh, Ramirez wants this fight to happen because he doesn't want to get involved in a boxing match. I think a boxing match would would actually maybe been suited Ramirez slightly because the way, the way it was going on, I felt uh, Mares was just way way too big from you know at the weight, and that was Mares up at super featherweight as well. Uh, is he up at super featherweight? You see, I thought they were going to try and keep him at featherweight because whenever it, it looked like the Frampton Santa Cruz fight was going to happen, there was a lot of talk of Santa Cruz. I think actually said this to me himself that they were looking to move him up to fight Mares. I think that was a fight that they were interested in, and that would be a pretty good scrap. So I'm wondering how long he's going to stay around at super bantamweight, and I think Mares will come back down to featherweight. But if you look at the sort of top fighters. At the weight, I mean, you've got the likes of Gonzalez, obviously Donair and Walters. I mean, we've got the whole sort of Aram De La Hoya thing. Are they going to work together and all that? But Mares would have his work cut out against at least four of the top five at the featherweight division, I think. You know, he'd, he'd be too wide open for, for a few of them boys. They're yep. massive half of the people at featherweight. Look at like the likes of Lee Selby, and like you said, Walters. Massive guys. Lomachenko, mm-hmm. he's pretty big for the weight as well. They just They just crush him. I think as well, Mares is pushing 30 now, I think as well, so moving back down and wait. He said that year of inactivity, I think he's had an operation as well for an injury. Yeah, he's, he's, on, the the he's on the slide, he's on the slide, yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, switching across town, uh, the HBO car gentleman now, as I say, is, um, I think Alex, I uh, know Donny was seen this, Donny, I'm still getting feedback off you, mate. Uh, Mauricio Herrera, Alex. Now, I watched the first three rounds of this fight. I was flicking back and forward between that and uh, the Keith Thurman fight. Uh, people were saying that, you know, he was robbed on the cards. Some people were saying that, you know, maybe he was deserved to be robbed on the cards because he was born style as, as usual. But from what I saw of it, you know, it looked like Herrera was forced in the fight and uh, 117-111 scorecard for Jose Benavides suggests to me is even though there were some close rounds in that fight, it looks like all those close rounds were were judged in the favour of Jose Benavides. Am I right in saying that? I didn't actually see the fight. I was just going off of um, what people were saying, um, you know, about basically the, uh, whoever was robbed again. I mean, he, he suffered earlier in the year against Garcia as well, didn't he? So uh, I'd have to defer to someone who actually watched it. Well, yeah, I saw it. I thought it was a really good fight, actually. I enjoyed it. I don't think um, uh, Ben. Uh, Benavidez's his sorry style was boring. I thought it was good. Whenever he got the jab going, he looked really good. He was tall. He was rangy. He just couldn't keep Herrera off him. That was the problem. Herrera was pushing him back to the ropes, and he was getting bullied around. But this was, I thought this was an excellent piece of matchmaking, and the scoring left a little bit to be desired. I think it was maybe the wide nature of the cards. But I thought it was... Herrera, I thought, had done enough to win. But it was an excellent fight. Really well-made fight. 
I saw someone make a point that, you know, uh, Herrera deserves to be fighter of the year this year because he beat Danny Garcia and now he beat uh, Benavidez as well, a top prospect. But he's been, you know, stiffed on both occasions. Uh, quite bad you, for him. I, I was actually following some of this early stuff of Jose Benavidez. He was getting hyped. I think he was training with Freddie Roach for a while there, but that hype since cooled. He's left Roach. I think he's training with his dad now or something. Um, and he's been quite quiet recently. I'm surprised that this fight actually got made. So, yeah, where's he ranked? Where is he in the rankings? I mean, is, is he, he who? Benavides? Well, he's that was an interim fight, wasn't it, for the WBA? Oh, was it right? Yeah, he's got a WBA interim title now. Oh, okay, fair enough. Well, that's a late welterweight, isn't it? So let's see. Jose Benavides isn't even ranked according I was to trying fight to, news. I was trying to find him on the fight news rankings, the same as you. No, you can't uh, see him anyway. He's, he's not no, in the top few. He's, I'm, I'm I'm saying, I'll, just, belt, yeah. I'll get the World Boxing Association rankings up just now, but just when you mention that, actually, obviously with, with, with that victory, I just wonder now if uh, Jesse Vargas' fight is going to get made anytime soon, because obviously that's the interim title, Vargas is this regular champion bullshit, so that's obviously a feasible fight sometime in the next what? six, seven months. I mean, if Fight, see, if, if fight News, I mean, unless it hasn't been updated, if Fight News have got their rankings right, you've got Herrera sitting right in the sort of top two positions, and Benavidez nowhere to be seen, so unless it hasn't been updated. Right, I've just checked the WBA rankings page, and they've got Benavidez ranked number nine, and that is for the oh. month of... That was published December... F- so, does it publish December fifth? But that is actually November's rankings of the published that for, so they must do it a month behind. Right. Okay. So where else we go there? Anyways, Donny, if you're listening, mate, uh, if you're going to jump in, just remember uh, to mute once you finish speaking, mate. You anything you want to say in this fight? Which one? Uh, Benavides against Herrera. Did you see it? <laughs> yeah, robbery. Yeah, I thought it was it's... disgusting. How did you score it? Uh, 117-111 for uh, Herrera. Right. That being the case, then... I mean, I wish, it, was like, it was like almost like all three scorecards were, you know, I mean, tilted the other way. I mean, it was, I, don't, I don't understand it. Do you think well, it was a worse robbery than uh, the Danny Garcia fight? Uh, yeah. It was, I mean, it was close. Uh, I mean, it's uh, they were on par with one another. Um, I mean, I just yeah. I mean, I was just really disappointed. You you can't help but feel for Mauricio Herrera. I mean, he's really been. If there was like a like a like a screwed fighter of the year award, like S F O T Y, like I mean, like he would he would he would be like the 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 hands down winner because he's he's just been getting it up the up the bum. Uh, for, for, for fucking the whole right, without, long and it's without Vaseline as well. <laughs> raw, no he, he's, big, he's been up, up the bum raw without any Vaseline. But <laughs> I mean, I still want to see his fight. I watch his fight later on. I'm actually still downloading the fight, so I'll catch that later on. But being the case, that's another shocking scorecard there. Another thing is, I got clocked up. Um, the scorecard for Matt Koroboff and Andy Lee, fifty forty-five with two judges. <clears throat> Donny, <clears throat> and one judge had a 48-47 to Matt Koroboff. As I said, I didn't see the fight. I saw the knockout, actually, you know, a six-inch hook, as he says. That's all you need sometimes to knock someone out of six inches. Um, <laughs> well, six-inch hook, pace that put him on Queer Street. Slava, I believe, was reaching for the nearest rope. And uh, he's probably going to come back and say, as you know, it was a corrupt black man stopped the fight too soon. Koroboff was getting back Lucky into the fight. Shot. Lucky shot and all this fucking sort of nonsense. At the end of the day, Korobov was gone. There was no dispute about that right hand when he landed and he followed it up. And I'm really pleased for Andy Lee. I mean, this is, this is a guy who's really had to dig in over the times. Steve, as your fellow, fellow Irishman as well, as you'll be very, very pleased to see him win his, his first world title. Delighted. I know I always drop my little silly anecdotes in, but again, seeing him in Limerick Leisure Centres fighting and, you know, busting his gut for this world title and... Yeah, obviously he got the Chavez fight and he was too Chavez was just too big and he's had his chances, come back from the adversity against Brian Vera and he's a real nice fella, so I'm really pleased for him. And it was that right hook again, wasn't it? Like in the last fight, just bang on the chin. That started all the trouble for Korobov and he never recovered. I mean, seconds later it was over. I thought it was an excellent stoppage from Kenny Bayliss, the world's best referee in my opinion. And he, he, he the British referees could you know, watch that video. He waited, he watched 
and he jumped in after Korobov had been given every opportunity to throw back, and he didn't because he he was out there on his feet. And early on in the fight, Lee was lunging in a little bit. He was leaving himself a little bit square on, and I was actually impressed by Korobov's stance. This is the first time I'd really sat and watched Korobov actually as a pro, but his stance was very effective. He was cagey, and his hands and shoulders were nicely tucked in, and it was difficult for Lee to get at him cleanly. And uh, But he was a confidence fighter, Andy Lee. And after he landed that left, uh, I think it was a left hand in the third round, he won that round, and then he visibly started to grow in confidence. And Korobov started finding a home for the right hook, and neither man was really landing an awful lot, but it was a really high technical affair. Two world-class boxers. The corner work, uh, I've said before, I actually like Adam Booth as a corner man, no matter what you think. I think he's quiet, you know, very unassuming type of in the ring. He's he's quietly confident. He, he instills Lee with that nice little bit of confidence. And I mean, how stupid does Peter Quinn look now after Kyle above getting knocked out? And I, I don't mean because of those funny glasses he was wearing, but the fact that <laughs> he, you know he should have been he should have been cleaning up there really. But Andy Lee, brilliant, well done. Just think, I mean, I, th- I think in either one of those fights, I think Quillen could have, could have beat any, you know, the two of those guys probably in the same night, maybe. And I don't think Quillen's anything great. I think as well as, I was I mean, slightly concerned that Andy Lee's losing these early rounds and stuff, you know. He, he looked laboured in his performance in Denmark. He uh, he was down against John Jackson. He was down mo- every scorecard against Matt Korobov. And he, he turns it around with, with, with a right hook. Um, I just, you know... I just be concerned about that. I don't know what it is, but uh, really pleased from all round that actually. So uh, I really think his next fight. I think people want us to mention about the the Billy Joe Saunders fight, but I think we'll leave that just now because I think that's come up in one of our Twitter questions. Um, we'll probably get a, a a voluntary first, won't we? Yeah, I think he maybe get that. F- it depends really. But uh, who's, who's his promoter just now? Is it, is it Bob Arum? Eh? He's still with Arum. Um, uh, I'm sure well, he's we with. Oh no, he's with um, he's Di Bella. Yeah, De Bella so he's, yeah. with, he's with Lou. So yeah, sorry, he's I with De Bella. Mentioned the other week. I mean, Adam Booth said in an interview that if Andy wins, they've got an agreement with Frank Warren to make the first defence against um, Billy Joel. Now, I know Warren said that he wants, if Lee won, he wanted the fight to be on his February twenty eighth show. I mean, that that's too soon. I mean, that's unless Lee's offered crazy money, I can't see him jumping in straight into that fight at the end of February. To be honest, but that I think that fight is what's going to happen next by what they're. Booth and Warren are saying. Well, it's only yeah. two and a half months away. It's not as if Andy Lee got battered in the Carabao fight. It was a very low-key fight, really, wasn't it? I mean, there wasn't a lot of thrown and a lot landed, so you could make it in two and a half months. I think it will. Yeah. Then if, if Frank yeah. is up and post as a printed already, man, it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really yeah, pleased yeah, to see that, 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 that Manny... Sh- just saying that I'm really pleased that Manny Stewart's uh, widow was there as well. I used to mm-hmm. see him. Because obviously, you know, Andy stayed with, with Manny and the wife over in Detroit for so many months, or many, many months as he's trained in, in the... And, mm-hmm. You also got to remember with Manny Stewart as well. If you remember when um, Adonis Stevenson knocked out Chad Dawson, mm-hmm. he said, you know, Manny Stewart said when I, when he trained me, I'd take the fight. If I ever get a fight with Dawson, take it, I'll, I'll become champion. He was right. He said that to Andy Lee, you know, you will be a world champion. And, you know, I, I didn't think he would, and, you know, he's been proven right again, you know, so... You know, every no one questions Manny Stewart. He know, you know, he knows his stuff, and he always believed that Andy could go on to do it. And look like you, I mean, I was delighted to see him to see him win that fight. And you know, we talk about you know world title bouts. The there's too many, but to someone like Andy Lee, you know, that you could see that was his dream, and he's realised his dream. No matter what happens now, he can say he was a middleweight champion, and you know, fair play to him. The, th- the thing is about Lee, I think, as well, Kurt, is over the last few fights in particular, his flaws have become more apparent mm-hmm. than his actual what he has to offer. Like, a, a lot of people have focused a lot on what he does badly, which is fair enough because his performances have warranted that kind of, you know, that, that kind of analysis. He's, he can be bullied, you know, he looks ragged. When he gets hit, he, he, he looks like someone who's got hit, who's pretty much every hard shot looks like he's about to get stopped. He didn't look impressive in Denmark. He didn't look impressive against Anthony Fitzgerald in, in the fight in Belfast. And, you know, we've seen that against Brian Vera. He can be bullied. But, you know, you overlook the fact that he can punch hard, especially with the right hook. I remember him knocking out, I think it was Robert Daniels, very early on in his career with that right hook. It's always been a big punch for him. And he does possess the power. And he is a very skillful guy with a good jab. And I think that, you know, like I said, he's 
fl- defensive flaws have, have sort of overshadowed the fact that he is a, a fighter, well, at world, world level now. And I just want to say about, you know, Matthew Macklin, you know, you saw Darren Barker win a world title, you know, he saw Andy Lee win a world title. I always thought Macklin <laughs> thought he was way better than he actually was. You know, he always seemed to think he was, you know, he's going to America, signing with Dibella, and he's going to be a, this, you know, be, win these big fights and everything. You know, how must he be feeling, you know, and I bet he'd love that Lee fight now. Yeah, missed the boat yeah, all them again. I'm actually, I'm actually, I'm actually laughing at Mark when actually, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm hating the guy. We didn't want to be negative as, but we usually get classed as sometimes, you know. But I always felt that Mark had that, had that, a, a grandiose yeah. sense of entitlement that his mm-hmm. position didn't really warrant it, you know. I think he, he was, you know, he's a good based, fighter. Based on the Sturm fight, I think, I think that, you know, I think people said, oh, you won that fight, you beat a, a great fighter in Sturm in Germany, you got robbed. And I think from then he really felt. You know, I deserve these. You know, big fights. I deserve to be a champion. And you know, you got to prove it in the ring. And I didn't think he he did enough anyway. And if well, he fought Lee now, so close against Sergio. Also, I think that was that yeah. also I think inflated his stock a little bit because at that time, even though Sergio was slipping, I think a lot of people didn't necessarily see it or wanted to see it if they were fans. Um, but he was slipping a little bit, and it made Macklin look really good um, because I mean he was basically in an even fight with Sergio Martinez. Uh, through ten rounds, um, before he Sergio dropped him as well, didn't he? Pardon? Macklin dropped him as well, didn't he? Yeah, I mean it was more of a balance knockdown or anything, but yeah, he did drop him. That's right. Yep. I was at that fight. I was sitting in the front row. Nice. <laughs> um, but I remember I was actually sitting really close to Lou DiBella, and he was—he did not look like a very pleased man when he was watching that fight. <laughs> He <laughs> looked like he was about to throw up, but then when Sergio stopped him, obviously, uh, you know, everybody uh, in his section and around him, you know, who had an interest in in uh, Sergio winning that fight, definitely erupted with uh, with uh, with cheers. Finally, um, I know there was a card from England last night, in Box Nation, uh, which I don't think any of us saw. But one of the one of the weird or one of the most shocking things coming out of that card last night was. Ian Butcher dropped a decision um, against, I forget, was it Kovacs, I think his name was. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I briefly text uh, Butch and he says he's actually, he's got a eye socket damage and he's perforated his left eardrum and it's potentially now going to damage his British title fight, which is up for purse buds against Kevin Satchel, who I think will probably actually vacate that title. Uh, during, the, the, during that card, I actually watched... Um, We've missed the Tim Bradley fight. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Poor Timmy. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, leave it now. I'll briefly scatter passes one. The, the car from Denmark, uh, Eric Scoglin won a uh, unanimous decision against Glenn Johnson, 98, 92, 97, 93, twice against Glenn Johnson, as I says. But, um, you know, it was a, I thought those cards were very, very wide. I felt maybe a point either side, maybe even a draw. I think Johnson deserved a fair shake on, on those cards. He was working the body pretty well. Scoggin was getting pushed back all the time. Uh, I just think maybe Scoggin got himself back into the fight later on, later into the, the last maybe four or five rounds. But I think Johnson, so if, he, if he lost, he certainly didn't lose by that much. I just bouncing back briefly to the Tim Bradley fight against Diego Chavez. Guys, the way I saw it was this first four or five Rounds easily, but badly. Um, we discussed. We had a Leatherman basically saying, you know, you know, his daughter's a big judge in his household. Well, I think he needs to take her aside and ask her how the hell he got a 116-112 scorecard for Diego Chavez. Uh, I think I had a 116-112 for Bradley. I think, Steve, you had it even wider. I think you had a 118-110, didn't you? Yep, 118-110 I had. Um, I've got it here. I was surprised at the outcome, so I know, although maybe you shouldn't be too surprised these days. But um, it was a strange sort of a fight because even though Chavez had obviously mixed at this type of level before and he was coming in as a live opponent, I never got a, a, a feeling at any point during the fight or in build-up that he was going to be able to win. I mean, and that for a big HBO main event, was an, that was odd because I think this was more... The whole card, which is an excellent card, rather than my event. I just never, never thought of Chavez winning. It didn't. I just didn't think he ever had a chance. And obviously, the judge showed my ignorance by calling it the draw. But I had it one eighteen, one ten. I mean, I suppose you could narrow it down to like 
116, 112 or something like that. But I don't know. Um, I thought Brad really didn't like him playing early on, especially at the headbutting and that. From what I saw, it wasn't, I don't know whether it was necessarily even Chavez's fault. Maybe I'm completely wrong on that. But, I mean, Bradley's never been the type of guy to be averse to throwing in the head himself, has he, in the past? So, um, all, all in all, I thought he won clearly and convincingly. And I hope Chavez kept the receipt from the tattoo parlour because there was some terrible ink dotted around his body last <laughs> night. I mean, simply, it looks like his mates had done them on him after a night on the piss or something. He's been in prison, I reckon. Uh, it's certainly not, not a sale or a turn anyway, put it that way. <laughs> but yeah, well, just, um, just to ask what we've got, he's on. Is anybody finding the sound a bit funny here? Yeah, it, has got, it went a bit funny about a, a minute ago, I'd say, yes. Yeah, you, sound, you actually sound fine, actually, just now. Yeah, yeah everyone else does now. Comes it's, and goes, yeah. doesn't it? Comes and goes. Yep, yeah, okay. Uh, guys, just we'll very briefly break down the, the Bradley fight because we'll need to move on very briefly to the other news as well, so. I just thought he. He was far better. He landed more shots. He was throwing a lot more. Um, he he worked a lot better on the inside than Chavez. I mean, Chavez had a couple of good rounds. I think Bradley slowed down a bit towards the end. I thought maybe he thought that he was winning comfortably. He didn't really have to risk anything towards the end, even though I think his trainer said, oh, you know, you've got to go out there. You've got to really seal the deal, I think, for the, for the last round. But I thought he, he was just winning comfortably. He, he was throwing those big overhand rights that seemed to hit Chavez at will. Uh, obviously, I had a bit of the scuffle with the heads early on, but no, I just thought that was really clear for Chavez, and I, I don't know what fight Julian Edelman was watching to have it 8-4 for Chavez. That's just... Uh, I can't even fathom... That's like fucking CJ Ross sort of fuck up, that is. I mean, but, you know, I don't really want to see a rematch either. It seems a bit of pointless to a rematch. It's a bit of a pointless fight to begin with. Uh, Bradley was so much of a favourite. I think both of them should move on and, uh, you know, do better things. I'm just looking at the site there, sorry, I'm just saying, Slava's popped up on that, on that, uh, Matty Kaurabov, Andy Lee card, and he actually says, that was one of the worst topages I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Have you said that? Uh, there's, there's this white supremacist on their site, he's actually a Russian guy, or claims to be a Russian guy. All his favourite fighters are white Russians. And oh. he, says, he says during the week that his exact comments were as follows, right, this is about uh, Matty Korobov. The coward quill and up the superior Korobov and vacated the WBO middleweight title. I'm looking forward to the Korobov Lee world title fight. Korobov will destroy Lee. So I asked him to break it down for us. And then basically everyone's been up been on top of his ass after he fucking failed to deliver, eh? So Yeah, I think on the um the Bradley fight, I think you could say Chavez getting four rounds, maybe five at a push. I mean there's some rounds Bradley didn't do much, but I just thought the first six or seven rounds were really good action. I think, you know, Bradley he has got that habit of you know, even though he's not a puncher, he fights as if he is a puncher, he gets inside, he throws in wild punches. You ain't going to find too many tougher men in the sport than Tim Bradley, you know. He, 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 for a guy who can't punch hard, you know, he goes to war and he, he stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with guys. That's why you got to respect him, you know. He, he goes right into people. Look how he fought Pavonikov. Same kind of way I thought he went to Chavez, you know, but he felt like he could take his power and he went to war with him. I thought he, he should have won the fight. I, like Alex said, I don't really see the a rematch I, I, they might do it but I hope they don't I, I think they're more likely to see uh, Brandon Rios in with Bradley if he can beat um, Alvarado which he should do because Alvarado looks pretty much done to me but that's another fight that can keep Tim busy I suppose until he waits for you know, an, a, a big fight but there's, n there's not a lot of options for him at the moment for a, a potential big fight well, I thought Chavez was beating Rios when they were fighting before yeah. I mean, that fight was a fucking mess in the first place, the, the whole Chavez getting disqualified and that. I think that was a bit of a corrupt thing in the first place for him to be thrown out like that. But, you know, Rios isn't in a much better position, to be honest. I'd rather, I don't know what I'd rather see for uh, Rios next. Obviously, the Alvarado fight. But Bradley, I think he needs to be fighting important fights more. I think the fact that, you know, Goy are fighting uh, together with uh I'm a bit more now. I think it opens things up a little better for Tim. Two million dollars Tim Bradley got for that fight last night. I heard yeah, two million dollars, so he can he can keep fighting those level fights all, mm -hmm. all he wants if he's fighting for fucking two million dollar purses. That's what he's uh, the renegotiation been doing, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're talking about him moving up to like middleweight. Donnie, you got that 
big back off mute again, mate. It is muted tonight, okay. I'm still getting some feedback. Is this, is this update with Skype? Fucking shit. Yeah, it's muting back now. Is it coming back to us again, eh? Yeah, the feedback was there. Right. Anyways, as I say, I don't think Bradley should be up at late middleweight. She's stay at 147. And this is actually quite annoying, this feedback. If he's all kind of guys, just, just try and all mute, mute, your, mute, your, mute your mics for me just now, just so we can get through this. Right. Um, Friday night, now none of us saw, I believe, the card from on Showtime. Uh, Leonard, El Leonard Ellerbe from Mayweather Promotions actually promoted this fight. Erez Landy Lara won a unanimous decision, 119-109 twice, 117-111 against Ishi Smith. Fight of the year candidate for what I hear. Hmm. Uh, Badu Jack, he is a six round knockout victory as well against Francisco Serra. Steve, mate, you saw the Marius Wack fight briefly, please. Marius Wack fight, let me think what happened in that. It was a seventh round knockout. Uh, uh, Travis Walker did okay, actually, from what I remember of that one. The the uh, version I watched of it wasn't wasn't that good. It was sort of looked like it was an old computer game or something on YouTube. But Walker came out and he was quite aggressive and Wax a big old unit, and then he started to impress his style on Walker, and Travis started to take a beating from the sixth round, and he was he still had to go. Now he you know he went out on his shield, and I think Wax could provide quite a sizable test for any of the aspiring heavyweight contenders, the likes of Fury or Joshua. You know, if they wanted rounds against a tall, strong, yeah. basic kind of guy, then he'd be ideal. I, th I thought he looked okay. Yeah, there's um, no chance. Um, Joshua's banging him out early. If you're going with, in with Wack, you're doing rounds. Which is what we want to happen, actually. I just, you know, I think there'd be no mention that to Eddie Hearn that that would be a fight to, to get him in with. Yeah, I think he, he's been mentioned quite a bit. I mean, he's pretty limited, and he's not, I don't think, you know, he's, but he's going to beat Joshua, but he's a, he's a big guy, and like I said, I just can't see Joshua knock him out, especially early. I mean, if you watch the fight with Vlad, I mean, Vlad hit him with absolutely everything, and he was still standing. He didn't even go down, and he, he, his chin on him, I'm, I know he was on steroids as well, but that chin is just insane. <laughs> hey, right, guys, last card to very briefly uh, recap on. Uh, this one was on ESPN Thursday night. Now, I didn't watch it because I didn't think there were many great fights on it. So I got hit up on Twitter the following morning saying, Andy, why you not watch this fight against Iskandon against Tyson Cave? Um, 117-111 to Iskandon, 115-113 Iskandon, and 115-113 to Tyson Cave. Um, now who didn't see it? Steve didn't see it. Uh, Donnie's not around just now. And Kurt, did you see it, mate? I, no, I only saw the uh, Tava fight. Right, no worries. Well, what I saw of this fight, anyway, I had it 117-111 to Tyson Cave. Um, I can understand the the judge that had it one fifteen one thirteen to cave because really a lot of a lot I mean a lot of those punches he was throwing were were being blocked, you know they were landing on elbows they were landing on gloves you know and coupled with his running sometimes you know that kind of herky jerky style, Escandon's constant pressure and the fact that when Escandon did land his punches it did seem to kind of there were more thudding shots they were shaking cave up slightly. You know, those probably added a lot of pluses into, into Iskandon's column a little bit. But in the end, I just cannot see how Ryo Kainya can find a scorecard of 117-111 for uh, Iskandon. And I think the FBI should be called in to go and check if he's got any offshore accounts because that was an absolute <laughs> disgusting scorecard. And, and one thing is what I want to kind of get on about Terry Atlas. Now, Terry Atlas, you know, he calls a spade a spade, which is fair enough, okay? He's had many things to say about bad judging in the past, etc. You've seen him, that great YouTube clip calling up, uh, I think it was an official or some commission, talking about how they got the, they'd read out of a, a decision and it was, it was announced the wrong way and Atlas went absolutely batshit crazy and he, he heard them going on the, the official about it. You know, you've got Atlas after his fight saying that, you know, there needs to be a commission involved, you know, some congressman with a bit of guts to get involved here. But wait a minute, Terry Atlas, you have got first hand experience and accounts of what goes on inside the boxing world. You are probably I mean you've probably been witnessing some of some of these corruption events. Why don't you start a petition? Why don't you go to your local congressman or whoever it is, your local politician and try and get something set up and go through government and try and get a national commission put in place? I just I fucking sick and tired of this guy sometimes just constantly moaning about these judges and stuff. You know, 
it's probably something else we can discuss upon on the Twitter question as well as, you know, how we're going to, you know, eradicate these poor scorecards because it, clearly something needs to be done because these last couple of years, if not this year as, as well, has been absolutely deplorable for discussing scorecards. And uh, just to finish off on that, Iskandon is actually a Heyman fighter as well, so maybe that's what's something to do, but you just don't know. Um, Kurt, mate, you want to cover up uh, the Tarver Banks fight very briefly? Well, very briefly. I mean, it was a shit fest, wasn't it? You got Jonathan Banks, who, you know, he he's obviously getting decent money because that he's not interested in fighting anymore. I mean, he he hardly threw a punch against Seth Mitchell, and when he did, he actually hurt him, and he seemed to realise, shit, I'm not supposed to do that, and pulled away and let him win. And in this fight, I mean, he, he didn't throw a punch. He, you know, how old's Tarver? Forty six, I think they said he was, and you know, he looked terrible as well. I mean, then in the the last couple of rounds, he started to pick up the pace a little bit and scored the knockout. What I found funny on the fight was uh, Teddy Atlas, you just mentioned him, but he, he made a remark like, what the hell must Vladimir Klitschko be thinking seeing his trainer fight like this you know, and get knocked out? But I, I, just, I just thought that was a pretty pointless uh, remark. I mean, you could stick nine-time trainer with the uh, Freddie Roach in the ring right now. Let's see how well he'd get on. I mean, that means nothing, does it, really? And who else in that card? Uh, was it Austin Trout? If in doubt, Trout. Uh, I think he won... Was it a UD he won or something? I can't remember. I've not got the scorecard in front of me. But anyway, very, very briefly, Alexander Juzek. Alex, you actually commented on this last night. I thought, or I think it was you or someone else anyway. That's him 6-0. Oh. He's boxed actually more rounds than... Uh, you know, he actually boxed more fight, uh, less fights than Joshua, but he's actually boxed more rounds. But he still won all his fights by, by stoppage. It just shows you he can go rounds, these, 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 great, uh, these great prospects, and go rounds and still... Uh, Still gonna you know stop their stop their opponents basically. Never saw the fight anyway, but yeah, Usyk is looking a he's looking a really good pro. I mean, you say prospect, but I think he picked up a some kind of WBO interim bout or some you know that's gonna get him in a position and you know he's gonna be targeting the the champions already. I mean, he's a really talented guy. He's a big guy as well. I mean, he's come great amateur background as well. I mean, this guy is. I, I don't think if you put him in with any of the champions anytime soon, you you know there'd be people picking him to win because this guy he's looking the goods despite him fighting you know limited opposition. Is this the guy with the funky hair? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Won the gold medal in in London, at heavyweight I think it was. Wasn't he in um, the uh, semi-pro sort of thing? I forgot his what name. What was he as a boxer? I think he was. I think he was in WSB. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, he was dominant in that, in that as well. Uh, Andy, sorry, can I just say one very yeah. brief thing regarding Tarver? Because I was watching him in, in action there against Banks, and I know that you know he was in completely terrible shape and everything, but he's starting to diminish now You know the, the achievements as a professional, because I think he's actually had a really good professional career, considering he came so late. You know, I mean, he, how old was he, about 36, 37, when he turned pro or something like that? Matt, you know, Tarver, he was very... Yeah. He, he was really old, wasn't he? And he had an excellent amateur career, and he came very late, and he wasn't afraid to take challenges on from the start. You know, he, he knocked out the likes of Eric Hardin very quickly and worked his way up to the Roy Jones fight, and he did things the, the hard way. You know, you know, he never ducked anybody, and I think he's had a good, a good professional career, Tarver, and it's worth just mentioning that, even though he's a complete parody of himself at the moment. I mean, when did he knock out Roy Jones? I mean, he was about 37 years old when he did yeah. that, wasn't he? I mean, how long ago was, he was that? Pro, he turned pro when he was 29 years old in 1997, apparently. Oh, did he? Oh, I'm full of shit then, sorry. It took him, <laughs> it took him a while. To, yeah, but it took him a while to really get any fights of note, didn't did he? he, did, yeah, he yeah. A, did he not win an Olympic medal? Was he 96 Olympics, was he at? Or bronze, yeah. bronze, yeah, he won a bronze. Was that bronze medal? Yeah, I thought I, I remember reading something about him actually. Cause I remember he was really begging for that Jones fight. Actually, yeah, like, I must have got him mixed up. Sorry, with somebody else. I thought he turned pro later than that, but um, he's well. I mean, he's been around. Well, how long has he been a pro now? Then sixteen, seventeen years. Oh, also as well, he's, he's got that Hall of Fame win under his under his belt as well. On his Rocky Balboa, you know, toughest chin <laughs> in the business. Eh. <laughs> uh, just on the Twitter questions, guys, we've got one in here from Boxing Tip. Now, this, this is actually a good question, this, and it kind of follows on to what I was just basically stating there about the S-Candle and Tyson Cave fight. Uh, boxing Tip Advice is actually asking, here's one for the panel. Should female judges be allowed to judge male fights? Not a sex issue, they're just shit at it. Well, not brutally honest, I don't think it matters what, you know, what, uh, what they are, if it's a man or a woman. I just think there's absolutely incompetent judges out there. But I think last night, I think it was... 
more evident for what I've watched. I've watched three fights with shocking, and I mean shocking decisions. And I think we're now at a point here where I think the judges, A, have to be taken into a booth with a TV and watch a fight and score it from there electronically, or B, they need to be put up in an elevated position looking down on the ring so they can actually see punches that are getting punched over other Because you, you get a referee blocking your position. They could be at the other end of the... Uh, uh, let's see, look at the shit I got for uh, when I posted on Twitter and I was live ringside for the Burns-Gonzalez uh, fight. I had Burns up at a point so that everyone at ringside that night, when I got home and watched the fight, I watched it at 3am in the morning and I had reversed the uh, decision because some of the punches that I saw Burns block at ringside looked like they landed on TV. So something needs to get done here. I think we're now in a position we need to get these judges to kind of move somewhere else in the arena. You mentioned the elevated um, judging seat. And I remember a ri- in the Ring magazine a few years back, Teddy Atlas actually was working with a referee. I can't remember who it is now, but he's working with a referee about that very idea. Uh, and he actually had like... That was... Uh, dia- you Cortez. Joe Cortez. Yeah. They had diagrams of it. You know, exactly like a tennis umpire. You know, them seats. But what the problem they were facing was they were getting um, like feedback was the fans behind them that they'd, they'd be complaining about seeing. So they, they, they was trying to work out a way to like try and make it you know easier for them. But that was the last I heard of it, and nothing's come about it that I've seen. But on the um, female judges, I mean, to me it doesn't really matter. I mean, the one thing I've noticed, and I don't know about these judges, I don't know where you know who they all are for the other fights, but some of these Vegas fights, the judges. Are like seventy and eighty years old. I mean, how can you have a guy who's that old judging a fight? It just I know like he, he, he might just pass out or fall asleep or die on the spot or something like that. <laughs> at that age, you know. That's, that's what I mean. I mean, if you look at other sports, I mean, you, you know, I'm not against against them for being old or anything like that. But I'm just saying, you know, in this sport, it's such a fast sport, and I just think an eighty odd year old guy at ringside or a woman. It, that's 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 the biggest factor for me. There's got to be some kind of age limit, in my opinion. I would yep. have said maybe, I always think to myself, well, maybe the more judges and then you'd have a wider scope. But then I suppose the fact of the more judges, you know, the promoters are going to have to pay then, aren't they, for more officials and everything. So I can't see them going beyond the three. I know that in the amateur system, they've tried quite a few different things. And I was at um, an amateur show on Friday night there at the Ulster Seniors. And there was two or three really dodgy decisions there. And they had, what was it, five, six judges pressing buttons or whatever. So it's, they're still it's doing that scorecard in Ireland. They're still doing the electric scoring. They're not actually doing the ten point must now, no. Oh no, they're, d- they're doing the ten point must system. Yeah, right enough. But um, they have the four judges all all around on the um, on the wee tables, jotted around in different positions. And you think to yourself, oh, well, at least they've got varied views, but they're still coming up with the same sort of decisions. So. I mean, I don't know what the answer is, really. You could put a pair of headphones on them or something or chuck one of them up into the stands, but I don't think it's a male-female issue anyway because no. any, you know, you can put in a bad scorecard no matter what no matter what sex you are, but maybe the, the fact that some of the boys are a bit older could be a valid reason. Uh, just before we get a C-Forn, who's going to come on very briefly, uh, Donny, you know, we know your connection. What is the general consensus around about your area, shall we say, um, about these terrible scorecards we've been getting. Well, actually, what, I know. I, what, I, what is the best way forward? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's maybe just like a like a ranking system or something like that, where people keep track of it. I mean, people don't really keep track of these decisions. I mean, you can go on box track and you can look at people's you know sketchy decisions, dodgy decisions, or whatever. Um, to be honest, I mean, um, what like last night with the Bradley Chavez fight, you had. Was it Julia Letterman? Now, to be honest with you, I've only ever disagreed with her on like one fight that I can think of in recent memory, which was the. Uh, she's usually really good. Scott yeah. fought. Yeah, she's good. Yeah, she is normally pretty good. Uh, but she, she, when Malik Scott fought uh, some Russian guy, uh, Glaskov, and I think she scored it a draw, whereas I had Malik Scott winning that by a couple of rounds. But um, so I remember that was like one one bad one. But but other than that, I mean, she's normally pretty good. Um, she's normally very, very good, and uh, that was really surprising to see from her. But you know, it's not you know the 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 questioner uh, from who asked us this question on Twitter didn't mention Dave Moretti, right? So he he gave didn't he give the same score um, to, uh, to 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 Brad? I mean, excuse me, to uh, to Chavez. So I mean, uh, takes takes two to you know to um, make that decision. Who was the person that had it a draw? I think it was a scorecard in front of me just now. Anybody built it? 
Yeah, well, Metcalf had it for Bradley, didn't he? He was the only one who had it for Bradley. I can't. Um, Metcalf the other, whoever the was other... the one who did the uh, Benavidez score, I think. And oh, I think, okay. And the other guy was the draw, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I mean, it's just, um, you know, I, I think that just if you mess up at a high, at a, at a title level fight or something that's a main event, then you need to not be assigned to another title level fight for, I don't know, six months, a year, whatever it is. But I mean, you know, and I'm not, when I say screw up, I don't mean like, okay, you have it a little bit wider to the winner than maybe you should or something. But I mean, like you have it, you know, it's, it's, it's seven rounds to three one way and you have it seven rounds to three the other way. And, you know, the, the rounds were pretty clear. I mean, something like that. You know, I mean, I just think that there just needs to be a little bit more accountability where people need to be rewarded for their successes. So, you know, you've already, you've done a good job in a bunch of title fights in a row. All right, you get to judge the next big fight, you know, that's going to be on TV, that's going to matter. And uh, you haven't done a good job in some recent fights, so, you know, you're going to have to sit on the sidelines for a bit until you prove that you're back at the uh, level that we would demand for world-level fights. But that's the thing, and this is the problem with it. They probably do reward them for giving good scores to their fighters. You know, they reward them for the wrong reasons. They reward them for giving, you know, positive and good lights towards the people they're promoting. And this is the, the two biggest issues with it is you can't prove whether or not they're either being corrupt or just incompetent. I mean, how can you tell if what, you, you know, we've, we've all said that Julie Lederman is usually a good judge. What was that score last night? Was that just incompetence? Was she paid off? Was she just having a bad night? Was she on a period, maybe? Fuck knows what was going on. <laughs> but, you know, uh, what was going on there? And you can't prove these things. And the other issue is, no one gives a fuck. No one, no promoter, no manager gives a fucking damn unless it happens to them. When it happens to other fighters, you've never, you'll never ever hear a promoter moaning about a bad scorecard that was in his favour. You'll never say, you'll never hear them say, oh, that fucking 119, 109 to my fight. Oh, God, that was a disgusting score. You'll <laughs> never hear that said. And because they all benefit from it, so there will be nothing done. More of them benefit from these dodgy scorecards for their fighters against journeymen that come over here and possibly, you know, fuck things up a little bit. They need the dodgy scorecards. They need the corruptible judges then. So they're fucking fine for it to happen then. But when they'll, they'll feign, you know, interesting, uh, you know, making the sport clean, making it safe, making it better for everyone when it happens to them. But ultimately, they don't give a fuck because they all profit and they all benefit from it. Alex went yeah. very negative there. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he's right in the day. I think Adam had, had a bit of a go there, a bit of a go there last night as well. And it says, I mean, if it's corrupt or incompetence, none of them is really, is it really a good sign for the sport. And I'm surprised we haven't even heard anything back or in the news yet about Terry Atlas having a fucking aneurysm after some of these scorecards over the last three or four days. The thing is, though, I mean, yeah, he, he's right what he says, but I think that's the same for all sports. I mean, I've been down to the football where, you know, the opposition, one of the players has dived and you've, you know, gave him shit of abuse. It, the player on your team has done the same thing five minutes later and got a penalty and you're cheering. You're not saying, oh, you're a disgrace, no penalty, exactly. no. It's the same thing. And that's what happens in sports, the whole thing around. And it's, you know, and, th you know, that's one of our biggest hates about football is the diving. But when, when the shoe's on the other foot, you know, you complain about it and that's the problem that people have to look at. And, you know, it's not going to change if we keep doing the same things. Okay, we're going to get uh, a C phone just now, mate. Uh, we'll keep this one very brief because we've got a shitload of total questions to get through in the belly of the week. Just the listeners, there's apologies about some of the sound quality. Of, you know, Skype's actually been updated over the last couple of days there, and it's a new layout, and it's really, really fucking us a bit sometimes here. I see if you there. Yep, yep, I'm here. How you doing, mate? Yeah, can you keep it brief, please, mate? Yeah, I'll keep it brief as always. Um... Just uh, on a brief mention on the weekend results, I'm very happy for Andy Lee. I think he deserves it, and hopefully he'll, he'll get a few good uh, periods now. Um, I've seen him fighting Billy Joe Saunders at some point, but I'd uh, love to see him get a voluntary fighting first, and maybe against that uh, fellow Halen, who, who beat Matthew McLean. I think that would be a decent voluntary. Um, but in the Khan, I'm very, I'm very impressed with the uh, way he won. I didn't expect a unanimous decision. I thought he might get a majority decision, but the fact that he won every round, I was very impressed by that, and I think a lot of people were. Um, now, now, now just going briefly to the heavyweights, there's not been that much fights out there, 
I know that uh, the Wilder and Steven fight has now officially been confirmed for the 17th of January. That's going to be on show time. Um, I can't remember where exactly, but that yeah, in sorry, in, it's going to happen in, in Las Vegas. But that's been confirmed. Um, I think they're looking to get Neo Santa Cruz on the undercard of that fight. David has apparently been making waves again, saying he wants to come back for next year. He kind of plans to fight three, four times, which I think is very ambitious for a bad David A's recent standards. Um, the fight, the heavyweight fight I was looking out for was the Antonio Tova Jonathan Banks fight. Um, it's difficult to say about this. I mean, John, Jonathan Banks is very important not to assume he's a elite boxer. Yes, he does coach with Vladimir Klitschko. He was a great boxer, but it's very important that we don't uh, assume Jonathan Banks is a really good boxer. He's probably just another journeyman. I mean, if, I know he's beaten people like um, Seth Mitchell, but I think he, he caught him literally at the right time. He's beaten the likes of Nicholas Herter, but I think he, I think he grew against Jason Kevin. So um, he's pretty hot and cold, but I think he was averaging four punches. No, I think his average punch was four out of thirteen every round. So his work there was very poor, and I wasn't surprised that Anthony Tova won. Where does Tova go from here? I know he's after the big money fight. Um, he's after Vladimir Klitschko. He's been calling out David here for a few years. But I think if he's after the cash, he might well fight Alexander Kovetkin. I know the Russians pay these Americans to come over and get beat up. That makes sense. I know Marius Wack won, but apparently he was pulled up by the cops in Poland about a week ago about finding some drugs in his back of his car. So I know Wack's got history of drugs, so I don't know how that sits well with him. I think it was amphetamines he actually got pulled yeah. off on. I think it was his, his, his manager, his trainer, was the one who got arrested for it, I think. Okay, okay, that's fine. Thanks for cleaning that one up. Um, and also, Ted Yatless, yeah, I think Ted Yatless, is, Ted Yatless I think he's still, um, he, he got, you know, he's not a happy man for a lot of reasons, but I think one of the things that annoyed me was when, when he goes that Vladimir Klitschko might sack Jonathan Banks. Um, because of his performance, you know, it's nothing to do with we will never sack a Jonathan Banks. Being a coach and a boxer are two, two different things. Um, and something about decisions, maybe you guys can tell me, in the past, were decisions made by the newspapers? Going back to the 1920s or 1930s, most of the decisions were made by the newspapers. That was something that was stuck in there. And... The last yeah. thing as well, maybe somebody can answer, what's the American equivalent of a European naval fighter? You know how the Americans say, oh, that guy's European naval, that guy's European naval. What's the North American equivalent? On the on, on the American equivalent, Donnie, it would probably be the NABF type title, wouldn't it? Part what was that? Uh, what, is the, what is the American equivalent of the European title or European level? That would probably be like your NABF title, wouldn't it? Well, the NABF is like, um, say, so an American type title, wasn't like it? Like the WBO or something. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're 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 associated with one of the the world sanctioning bodies. We don't really have like regional titles. We don't have domestic titles. We just have like those those BS, like you know the like you said the NABO, the USBA, you know those sorts of things that go with the IBF. Like, yeah, I mean we don't we don't really have those. As, as for the other one, yeah, newspapers used to make the used to make the decisions, but also as well as there were a lot of deals made to make a fight if, if like fighter A lasted the the distance, it would be classed as a no contest. That's why you'll probably see a lot of like no decisions or no contests in some of these older fighters' records as well, because that was a deal that was made, you know. Yep. Yeah, so that's about it, really. And I I just end on one more thing. I'm probably going to get a lot of sticks for this, but my main man had a baby girl. Couple of days ago, with Vladimir Klitschko. Yeah, we sh- we should all wish a long and happy congratulations, but Andy didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't. I didn't know nothing about it. I mean, I'd imagine she. But you never know. You never know how that's going to affect him now. It might affect his training. You never know. 
You never well, know. It's, it's certainly affected her. I bet you her minge is now like a fucking near fixed hip. <laughs> Apparent, apparently, she, she weighs 67 pounds and she's 6 foot 2. Well, <laughs> she was well destroyed then. It'll be anal sex for the rest of their life now. And even touch your sides. Anyway, uh, cheers for that, Asif, mate. No problem, cheers, Dad. All the best, mate. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> what, what did you say? I never said nothing. Did I ever step the mat there again? <laughs> what? How dare you talk about Hayden's poor butt like that? <laughs> I tell you, well, anyways, best of luck to them, obviously. But, you know, Asif made a good comment there. You just didn't know how he's going to react now that he's got a child, you know. Some people act differently. Like, oh, for instance, Kovalev, he doesn't give a fuck. He doesn't even bother going to the birth of his son. He just says, no, I've got business to go and keep you, take care of first, then I'll see you later. Yeah, he, nothing phases that guy. That guy's like a turbine. <laughs> anyway, next question came in from Marcus Bellinger. Um, I didn't know what Brooke was being deluded about here, but I'll ask it anyway. What's more, uh, question for the pod, who's more deluded, Brooke or the people that actually think fighters A and B will actually face each other? What did Brooks say last night that was outlandish? Yeah, I think he said that Khan had to get wait in line. Oh, did he? All right, okay. I liked his uh, main reasoning to, to to make why they should make the fight, and apparently because I really want to hurt Khan. Oh, I mean that just sold it. Just for on that topic, just Alex, remember you mentioned last week about uh, about the slashing and that he was either gay or going into a drug deal or something. <laughs> did, did anybody did I say that? Did I? I yeah. don't know. Did you? Is it <laughs> Did anybody? Yes. Yes, I, I, I I wanted to take it out, but was told not to. So it's on someone else's head. Um, did Did anybody get tweeted the picture of him apparently in a shed fuel brothel during the week? Oh yeah, I saw that. Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I, I, I see. To give to it. It's a bit get, blurry, isn't it? But I can imagine yeah, Steve yeah. and Cutler kind of hiding behind the keyboard and don't go in there. Please don't go in there. <laughs> <laughs> with the, with the, with the I don't care. Alex said it. It's basically Second, a very blurry picture of a guy who looks a bit like Kel Brook. See, does, he have, does he have a stitched up leg? No, he's like in his clothes now. He's all dressed up. In, he's in a, basically a strip club or, I think, or a brothel. This guy that, that's claiming it in his, like a Facebook picture. And he's <laughs> taking a sly picture of Kel Brook, or what appears to be Kel Brook, talking to some guys and arranging uh, some paid sex, allegedly. <laughs> Yeah, man, I don't know, like, I mean, I mean, disgusting, you never have a mayor doing anything. <laughs> no, he just, he just on Skype getting his member out, you know. <laughs> hey, at least it's digital. Aye, well, listen, I've actually got a question in regards to that actually coming up, and it's actually quite a sick and funny one, but you know, we're like, we'll go anywhere. <laughs> Don't say the source for that, the source for that picture was from, like, an American, American yeah. fan, so, you know, <laughs> take what you want from that. Donny Ro- Roscoe, uh, sorry Roscoe, Rocco wants to know is how many wanks has Donny basketball had since the Can Master Class? Um, <laughs> I bet, I bet you, oh, I Donny, Donny, Donny basketball. basketball. I bet you, you could tear his elbow now, eh? I'm gonna, I'm gonna plead the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the, the refractory period's been a little bit long. Uh, not, not what I once was. Not in my prime anymore. So only about four or five. Only. <laughs> just it's getting old. Just found out there. Actually, apparently that picture was actually tweeted out by one of Amir Khan's guys. Apparently, I've just seen a guy on the on the name of Man Deep. I don't know if he means it Man Deep and shit or something like that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said that it was one of Khan's uh, fellas that posted that out. So we, he was saying why he's done that on Twitter. We've just found out he's old. <laughs> <laughs> You've been stalking Kelbrook. Uh, next question. Steve, when will Ward be stripped of his titles? Sick of hearing them. He's hearing about him on US TV. I don't know. Well, Ring Magazine have stripped him by now. Do you think of that title? It takes eighteen months, I think, for them. Oh, to is it eighteen him. months then? Yeah, eighteen well, months. For the ring, it is. I don't know. By the, for the belt in orgs, it's whenever they want, isn't it? They're flexible, aren't they? They'll keep him on board as long as it suits them, and then you know he'll be some champion in recess or something like that. Is I tell you what, his career's just completely fallen off the cliff. I don't even know what the ins and outs are with his legal issues. I mean, I know he's fighting with the Goosens. I don't know where he stands or where they stand, to be honest. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but it's such a shame to see a fighter. I mean, I know his style's not always the most pleasing on the eye, but to see him just wasting his prime away. And he seems so comfortable on HBO, you know, with the microphone. It's almost as if he's retired. He doesn't seem to be too concerned. I mean, the whole thing's just a complete farce. 
Interesting. Leonard Leonard was kind of the same way, although he did have legitimate health issues with his eye. But uh, you know, he spent most of the '80s behind the microphone rather than in the ring. Even though he has some all-time great victories in the ring, you know, scored in the '80s. So um, you know, he's still, Ward's still young. I mean, if he gets back soon enough, he'll be okay. I mean, guys have taken off 15 months before. Shit, didn't Khan take off 15 months or something like that? I mean, now look, we're talking about him, like, um, you know, probably fighting Mayweather. I mean, you know, taking off, like, more than a year isn't a death sentence, as long as it just doesn't turn into more of that. But I just I think that we're all frustrated because we have such high hopes for him, and we know what his potential is, and we've seen him dominate a deep division and basically rise to the number two undisputed pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world. And, uh, and then he just went from all that, and for no discernible reason other than just you know business disputes which you would think could be worked out he just kind of just fell off uh you know right in the, in the in the peak of his prime and you know it's uh what's that line from a bronx tale the saddest thing in life is wasted talent and that's what we see with andre ward right now and so it's uh for a fan of boxing who sees how good he is it is distressing to see that a fighter of that level of skill is just not uh um you know plying his craft for a living how old is he He's I think what, he's 31. 30, so. 31. I mean, do you think he's made enough money now to sit on the fence this long? Possibly, seeing that, yeah. seeing that he's, he's making some money with HBO as well, isn't he? But I don't think it went enough to kind of pay the Two more. million for his last fight, didn't he? That's yeah, right, plus, yeah. Plus, plus he got an extra off the basis of the, the Rodriguez didn't make weight as well, didn't he? Yeah. Extra 200,000 or something. Yeah. Uh, next question comes in for Kazim. He's asking, how would you beat this version of Khan? Attack first and get countered or counter and miss. I think, I think basically you've got to punch with him because he's that wide. You've got to punch. Same time yep, punch. You've got, to punch, you've got to time him, but you've got to punch when he punches because you're going to get lucky at some point. Because I've said before, he's wide open and he's still got the chin up in the air as well. So I think as well, as you've got to punch when he punches. Or, you know... He- if he does tend to, to just switch off briefly, like uh, he did against my diner in the first fight a long time ago now, but he can tend to, to switch off or get dragged into a fight, which it looks a lot harder to get him to do now as with Virgil Hunter. But, you know, he still does, you know, he still wants to fight. You know, what, no matter what people say about Khan, he's a warrior and he does want to go to war in a lot of his fights. Donny, is a blueprint in that new version of Khan? Not on 3.0. <laughs> Hey, next question. Chris Blackman. Wonderful finish from Andy Lee last night. What was everyone's highlight off the cards available? I think you've got to see it. It's probably Andy Lee. Yeah, it was a great punch, was it? Yeah. Try to think what else. Maybe maybe the Abner Mares fight, you know. I think you've got a guy there, slightly higher level than another guy, but it's still a fun fight at the same time. But I think it's got to go to Andy Lee for just that game changing right hook. Brilliant. Finish. It was a it was a brilliant night of boxing. It's just a shame it's took this long of the year to get it, and then they have to stick both the cards on the same night. It's, it's <laughs> so annoying that mate, isn't it? It was like us fucking recently when we had what card was it we had on? We had cards on Channel Five, which I think that was Stewie Hall. We had cards on Box Nation. And I think you had one on Sky at the same time. I forget. I think it was the one from Leeds. I think maybe I might be wrong about that. But there were three boxing cards and and you know, being shown on British television all on the same night, and then you had nothing. The following week, it was just I thought it was just a slight, slight waste. You could have spread these over two yeah. weeks, you know. I, yeah, I there was there was yeah. something though that, that that caused a conflict with that. Like I think next week, they never like to do events that close to Christmas usually. And then um, uh, the week before, I think was uh, Championship Week with college football. So they probably thought it would um, uh, basically it determines a lot of like who goes to the the, uh, the championship games and stuff. So. So they probably didn't want to compete with that. Maybe I would I would guess that that had probably something to do with it because they're concerned about ratings. So that's why uh, HBO moved its or excuse me Showtime moved the start time earlier to nine and HBO started at ten was that they were trying to make the main events not not conflict with each other even though they ultimately did because of um, just the way that that the card went certain fights that maybe people didn't expect to end in a stoppage did. Uh, and so they ended up, the main events ended up kind of overlapping, but the goal was to not have that actually. And that's why Oscar De La Hoya was actually present at both cards. He yeah, went I down the strip and, yep, yeah. Did, did Steve say it was a great night of box? We, we don't be positive on this show. It was shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think, I think what was shit about the night, as I say, is it was just, was just those shopping scorecards at the end of the yeah. day. Some of those fights just. This is like the, the player, ruined. the player haters ball. You ever seen that with the, <laughs> with Dave Chappelle? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> right, listen, I'm just getting a signal to, to, to me here, actually. Is it right? I think it might be right. Who's heard Carol Frotch's one personality of the year award? As D4. Oh, God. Now we can start the negativity. Oh, dear, 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 Is dear, that Adam dear. Smith coming on the Skype call there? Sorry. I don't you know. Had him? I don't know, but... I, I can't yeah, wait is, for Carl Frotch to lose. Honestly, I can't wait for him to lose that. Because he comes second to Joe Calzaghe yet again. He's just a bag of wank. Has he won it? Yeah, anybody confirm that? No chance. I mean, he's 250 to 1 to win it. You've got fucking Rory McElroy, who's like odds on favourite. You've got Lewis Hamilton, who's like 2 to 1. You've got someone else who I've never even heard of who's above him. You've got about six others who are above Carl Froch. I think Lewis Hamilton should win it, actually, not honestly, but there we go. Carl Froch can't win Personality of the Year because his personality is like a bad fucking turds. He's, he's Tony Bell, you in the running. <laughs> oh, Froch's personality is like that of a serial killer, you know. Alright, next question, Lee Davis. Alright, has Khan earned a shot at the pound for pound best out there despite never fighting for a world title at welterweight? Um, so this is pound for pound best out there. So I'm assuming he's talking about anybody in the top ten pound for pound who's at welterweight. So you've got Bradley, you've got Pacquiao, you've got Mayweather. Anyone else at welterweight I've missed there that's in the top Probably Marquez. Mm-hmm. I quite like the Bradley are... fight now. Mm-hmm. Eh? I quite like the Bradley fight now. Yeah, the, the Khan Bradley Yeah, I still want to see that really fight. I would like to see that fight. That fight should have got made at 140, but I still want to see that fight. It would be a great fight, but the thing is, you just mentioned Mayweather himself, Bradley, top rank, and Pacquiao at top rank. Now, with Khan, I mean, you know, he kind of has the star power and the... You know, he is, he is technically one of the few Al Heyman fighters who is also with Golden Boy... So Oscar has some say in that. So, I mean, in theory, maybe he could fight Pacquiao. But, um, I mean, it, you know, it, essentially, uh, it's, I mean, it's difficult for Khan to fight a, a titleist at this point in time. Uh, Al Heyman, or Keith Thurman reports that Al Heyman said that he'd like for Khan and Thurman to fight eventually, but not until later. He said he wants to build them both independently before matching them up. That's Thurman's interpretation of Heyman. Heyman's words. Uh, so, I mean, there's not a whole lot of opportunities for him to fight for a title, so he's fought a top contender in Devin Alexander that's as good as it gets. I think he would have fought Brooke, mm-hmm. but Brooke got slashed, so, uh, you know, there's not much not much you can do about that. Will is asking, if Floyd doesn't fight Khan or fighter B next, who is realistically an opponent? Also, I felt it was maybe maybe aiming for the Cotto rematch. Obviously, that's been trumped. So, who else is going to be realistically possible? Would tell I mean, Furman's performance last night or lack of action last night maybe slightly damaged him in that race. Um, I yeah, don't maybe know. Garcia. Garcia, yeah. yeah, yeah. Garcia, you think? He's Garcia would fit Steve's um, hatred of Floyd's uh, cherry picking routine, wouldn't he? He's like a slow kind of fighter, isn't he? <laughs> he doesn't, you can't see him. I know he can punch hard, but and that's what they'll try and play as you know. You know he's a danger to Floyd, but he, he's pretty slow, isn't he? And uh, you know Floyd, Floyd will beat him easy. You know, no disrespect to Garcia, but that's a bad start for him. Khan, you know we've got to be honest, he's a much more interesting fight for Mayweather. Yeah, and not only that too, but if if Floyd does get kicked off that date. Floyd might go, okay, well, I can't take the Mexican holiday. I know what I'll do. I'll fight. I'll, you know, he has been talking. There's been rumors Floyd has been talking to that Barclays Center CEO, you know, Mayweather in Brooklyn, fighting a Puerto Rican on the eve of the Puerto Rican Day Parade. That'd be, that'd be big time, you know, I mean, and, and, and he'd have a Puerto Rican opponent. So that'd be, you could see that happening. Next question, Steve, I'll go to you, mate. Billy Joe, uh, this is from Steve Guscott. He's asking, well, Billy Joe Saunders versus Andy Lee, who wins and how? Hmm. Well, I think it could be a fight of two halves, that one. I'd say Saunders will probably um, have the edge early on, and then Lee will take the late. Saunders looks like the guy at the time was always on the verge of getting knocked out, but nobody's managed to knock him out yet. But Lee does carry the power, so I would maybe pick Lee to wear Saunders down late, but probably the safe bet would be on beat him on points. But he might even stop him late, but I'd definitely pick Lee to win, and I think the fight would probably take place in London. Personally, I think it's going to matter as to see who's got the better gas tank, actually. 
Well, I think, yeah, Lee... Lee's tank's not too bad. He came, I remember against Craig McEwen in Las Vegas. He lost a lot of the early ones there, and he came back to stop him late. Um, Saunders, his gas tank looks like it's going, like I said, but he always seems just about cling on. I think it could be a bit wild at the end. Like, can you imagine the 12th round between the pair of them? They'd both be completely knackered. Um, let me see what else we've got. Ah, this is the one I'm looking forward to. This question for Shep. He's asking, what would you rather have, Skype with Amir Khan or FaceTime with Floyd Mayweather? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, sound, it, it sounds bad, but I'd rather go with Amir because you're going to live afterwards, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, but you probably, you probably need therapy after seeing him stroking his yeah, memory. Live with the nightmares or end the pain really quick. Yeah, the nightmares would stay with you for a while, but at least you carry on breathing for a bit. <laughs> I must say, Sh- Shep- Shep's questions are brilliant, aren't they? Like, yeah. every- <laughs> <laughs> it kind of breaks it up a wee bit, you know. <laughs> uh, Wasn't he? The, who was the one who asked about the um, Hall and what and compared him to ISIS? Who was the bigger threat to Britain? Was that was, that was not him. Best question. I think yeah, it was. was Shep as well. Yeah, I think it was. I. Eh? Um, that wasn't a question. That was the question. Was would you rather skate with Amir Khan or FaceTime with Floyd Mayweather? Who's the bigger threat to Britain? Uh, who has the greatest threat to Britain? Who was it? Who was it again? Nick Hawley and Jim Watt or ISIS? <laughs> 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 uh, next question from Rocco Alex. Well, Macklin, who is obviously thinking about quitting, now think if he beats Lee. Beats Billy, if, sorry, if Lee beats Billy Joe Saunders, that not only is he an Irish battle still on, but it's for help. So what basically, he thinks is if Lee beats Saunders, will Macklin now think, right, okay, I can take this fight now, step up and take it? An all yeah, Irish he'll, battle. He'll want the fight, and I think it's an easy payday, but I think Lee chins him easily. I mean, we saw the state Macklin was in last time he was out, and you got to pit Lee in that one all the way. I think there won't be with that many issues in making it. Maybe a couple of ego problems, but it's probably a really big fight in Ireland. And yeah, I, I really can't give Macklin any shot. At it. I think if Lee lands one of those right hooks on him, Macklin's going to be out cold. Going to be out on a fucking stretcher. A hey, bold revolution has got two questions in. First one, a hey, let's open up the other one. After last night's displays from Thurman and Khan, have any of you changed your mind on who would win if they fought each other? What was the consensus before that fight? Did it, did it, was everyone picking Thurman before that fight? Or before a few people were picking Khan, weren't they? Bit of mix. I just think at some point in that fight, Furman would hurt him. Now, whether he can finish him, I'm not sure. I mean, he had Bundu hurt early. He couldn't, you know, he didn't really press for it. it kind of shown, you know, he's tough and can get through things. So, you know, you, you see, you got to look at it as Khan points or Thurman knockout. I think that's the only way, really. And it, it's 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 like the Maidana fight all over again for me. It's just until it's over, it's going to be a really tense fight, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, edge of your seat type fight. Uh, you won't be able to, to, you know, get up and pop a bag of popcorn for that one because you know you might miss something uh, that could be huge. Um, I mean, basically, uh, yeah, I mean, I, to be honest with you, that, that's a coin flip fight. Uh, and I say that as a big fan of Khan, but, and, and also as a fan of Thurman, too, actually. I think he's, I think he's very exciting despite you know, some of the hatred he got for his uh, uh, his performance last night. But, uh, yeah, that's like a Maidana fight, and I think that the that the difference is, will it be like a Maidana fight, or would it be more like a Garcia fight? You know, when he got tagged by Garcia, his initial response was literally speaking to just straight forwardly go to war. I mean, he just went to war with Garcia, and uh, occasionally he was hitting him with some good shots, but, you know, more often than not, he was the he was the one that was hurt. He was the one in the compromised state, and he was the one who couldn't afford to be going to war after he got buzzed really badly and knocked down. Uh, and you know, I mean, he didn't make it through that, but he did make it through Maidana because he was he was able to get away. He was smart enough to fight, you know, when he would get his bearings back and then and then, you know, and then waste some time and move around. And, you know, he, he fought. I mean, even though he didn't fight intelligently in that fight, he fought intelligently enough to get out of there with a victory. Uh, and I think that it is inevitable that Thurman would hurt him 
in that in a fight with Khan. But I think the question is, could Khan get through it? Because he can get hurt and still survive, and you know, and still win rounds. But um, you know, could could he get through it? Uh, you know, on his feet. That's that's the that's the question. Next question from Ball Revolution. I probably need someone to dig me out this one because I haven't really seen much of Errol Spence Jr. I think I've maybe seen his pro debut. I've seen some of his amateur fights. He did have a good display. Ball Revolution states he did have a good display of work last night, which was probably was it Friday, Thursday night, I think it was. Do you think he has enough pop to make it at the top level? Don, you see much of him. I haven't really seen much of the kid, in all honesty. Uh, so I don't really can comment on his power. Sorry, just now. who was the question about? Errol Spence. Oh, that was on the. Um, that was on the. Well, it was televised in America, but it was on the untelevised in a card. You had to like watch like basically the Showtime Extreme, which I do have, but I just didn't get a chance. To, I didn't get home in time, so uh, I didn't see it. I mean, what I have seen of Errol Spence, though, I mean, it's all been very good. Uh, I watched in the Olympics. I thought he won that um, elimination fight. I thought he should have been in the medal round. Uh, and I watched a couple of pro fights so far. I mean, he's obviously very, very good. Uh, Freddie Roach has spoken very highly of him, and, and they, they asked him, I think there was an interview with Freddie Roach, they said, name one uh, boxer that's like, you know, young and up and coming that you think will uh, be one of the top fighters in the sport in the next day. And he said Errol Spence, and Freddie said he was when uh, Errol Spence, um, you know, basically like knocked the shit out of Adrian Broner and in, inspiring and, uh, you know, and, and Errol Spence had only been a professional for a couple of fights. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, essentially uh, everybody in boxing, and, and I've seen other interviews with other fighters as well, everybody's spoken very highly of him. Even though I didn't see Spence's fight last night, um, I mean, the buzz around him is all very, very positive. I'm just going to ask, was, was, it this, was it this guy who was rumoured to have sparred Cloner out in Spartan? Was it this guy yeah, or was it someone else? Seven, yeah. he, was, it, was, it, was it Spence? Is it true? Yeah, yeah. They, they, that's what people. Every, I mean, multiple people have said that. I, I mean, they could all be lying, but I doubt it. They're good friends, though, aren't they? Errol Spence and Brian, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of Brian, I mean, he's looking more like his dad every day, isn't he? Oh, he was. He's, 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 he's looking like a fucking <laughs> advert for the uh, for di- for diabetes or Weight Watchers. Or that, that's <laughs> well, it's t-shirts terrible. on. I can't breathe. I think he, it must have been too tight on him or something. <laughs> <laughs> he can't breathe. I, t- I tell you what, actually, the, the, uh, you see, if, he c- if he couldn't breathe, I think there'd be a, nas- a worldwide national holiday. Actually, just to meet your heart because you know <laughs> he he was the reason why the word eugenic was was incorporated. By the way, he's just a complete and utter whelk, <laughs> complete tosser, not a fan. Not a fan. Never have been a fan. Complete and utter waste of s- sperm. I thought he should have been donated for medical research. That prick. <laughs> Just speaking of Broner, getting off the love of Broner, who do we realistically see him in with next? Because he's been—he only fought twice last year, didn't he? To be honest, mate, I hope—I hope the next time we see him fighting, he's going to be fighting the AIDS virus. <laughs> <laughs> he's a cunt. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> they still lose a bit of weight. Uh, That's true. I, I could—I could see him fighting. I'd like Freddie to see Mercury style. Uh, I'd like to see a fight with Matisse. I'd like to see a Maidana rematch. Yep. Uh, yep. Garcia, uh, yeah, Garcia, Khan, maybe. Pacquiao, uh, <laughs> Kovalev, <Cool Kovalev. laughs> <Klitschko. laughs> Golovkin, <laughs> Klitschko. <laughs> uh, anybody just going to could knock him out. Anybody with realistic chance could knock him out would you know, would be suitable by me. Uh, next question. How comes... about, how about, I mean, I know it's not going to happen, but how good of a fight would it be to see him fight Terence Crawford? I think that'd be exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just, I just hope that Crawford would step in behind his punches and just absolutely lay the wee prick out. Yeah, you know? but I mean, you know, he's, he's, you know, they're both, they're both from the Midwest. They're both in the same area of the country. I mean, within a few hours, you know, it'd just be exciting. It's too bad their uh, uh, business issues would preclude that. I think that'd be an exciting fight. I tell you what, though, he's fighting my diner. He's one fight you can never get bored of watching. You can always flick it on. Even the first two rounds, he's just funny. <laughs> just for when you're alarm. feeling a bit low, just. <laughs> yeah. I hate my life. Let's put Brian on my diner. Right? Uh, he, like he, he, certainly, he certainly posted up some weird shit on Twitter and stuff. Uh, you know, yeah, I'll just say something. I'm mean, oh, sorry, Andy. <coughs> on you go. On you. Oh, uh, I, no, I was going to say, I'll tell you something, though. I think if that ref fight was a 15 round fight, I think it would have been interesting to see how the last three rounds would have gone. Broner was coming on that fight. I mean, you know, it was a step up for him too early, and. He was acting like a jerk before, and I think he, he thought he had the fight one before he stepped in the ring, and obviously he got humbled very badly. But, um, 
and he and he hasn't been taking these other guys seriously. I don't think either of the ones he's fought since since then. Um, but I mean, I just think it'd be interesting to to see that rematch and. Uh, and I and I think Broner was coming on at the end of that fight. To me, that was like the case for 15 round fights. Also, Chavez Martinez. Um, you know, would have been interesting to see that one go three more as well. To be honest, Donny, you see for all his faults, I know he's an idiot and all this. I actually like. I don't mind Broner's fights. You know, as stylistically and he's I, fun. I quite. Uh huh. Yeah. He's shit. <laughs> <laughs> Steve said to be positive, Alex comes back with some negative. This is it. Bring the yeah, negative shit going. He's, I think he's awful. I think the last couple of fights he's been, he, he spent more time posturing and acting like a total knobhead than anything else. And he's just more about the image and more about thinking that he's a great boxer than actually trying to be a great boxer. He's living this life thinking that he's the next Floyd Mayweather, but he doesn't want to put the effort in. I don't and know when he went. Yeah, I don't know when he went off the rails so much. Like I'm sure I've said on the pod before. Like when he was an up and coming boxer, I interviewed him on the phone. Like and he was all right. He was nothing like what he is now. I mean, his his ego has just completely exploded. Just the money, the isn't it? He's yeah. got so much money now, and like Andy said, that's what, that's what he likes to think. I wouldn't think he's got as much money as what people want to make it. No, I don't no. think he has. I remember when they they stacks twenty like notes, twenty dollar notes, and Floyd's going to be with fucking stacks a thousand. He was getting millions yeah, they, when he was in HBO though. They did. They did some kind of show, like you know, like a two days time. I don't know if it was two days, but it was like that kind of show. And they interviewed his mum, and his mum was living in a shack. And while he's got all his yeah, because he doesn't give a fuck about chains. his mum. I mean, he was he was jacking <laughs> grannies a couple of years ago. It's a fucking little prick. <laughs> jacking grannies. He was. He got fucking done. Or fucking jacking a granny at knife point or something. He's just a fucking little shite bag. Hope he gets stabbed. Seriously. Well, you can see when he when he he needs to go to the same club that Cal yeah. went to. Let's be honest. <laughs> when he, he's going to end up a crackhead in, when he retires, like come in. I reckon he already is. Yeah, if you ever saw the wire, I imagine he's going to be like the guy Bobble in the wire. He's going to just be a crackhead walking around <laughs> with a shopping cart, just with a brown jacket on, just with you know a can in his hand and just a few fags on his ears. He's just a he's just a knob. <laughs> Right, that's enough cloner talk just now. Next question comes in from... We should have um, a weekly hype browner segment. Yeah, yeah. the class be too negative. <laughs> Boxing Britain <coughs> asks about David Alexander's corner were they high last night? Still fall into the ring, slow, shit at the vice, etc. Look spaced out. So, you know, honestly, if anybody looks spaced out, it was David Alexander just didn't know what to do. I mean, I felt... I, I felt Cunningham was trying to do everything possible to try and get some urgency into his work. He was telling us, you know, this, the rounds were looking the same after the same after the same. I just think it was, you know, I was and I just couldn't put the game plan together. I think. I thought that Andy. That's why I said earlier, a shell. You know, can't beat a shell of Alexander. I didn't mean like he was shot or anything like that. He just looked like he was doped or like he had some kind of mental deficiency. He was wandering around with his head forward, like in his, you know, he, he looked like he was completely on horse tranquilizers or something. I don't know what was wrong with him. I've said Alexander's had a mental de- deficiency for years now. That's just on his outside ring personality. <laughs> I mean, he just the thing is, is that you had two guys who don't like to fight inside, and one guy was longer and faster. And that, that's your story, pretty much. Next question from Andrew G. Using the amount of recorded footage as the marker. Could we say that Roberto Duran is the greatest of all time? Well, we know what Andy's answer to that is. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was the first part of the question? It says, using the amount of recorded footage as a marker, or probably as like you know, I, as the marker, could we say Duran is the greatest fighter of all time? Yeah, based on fights that you can actually watch. I, I think there's you Ali. valid claims. I yeah, think there's Ali. valid claims you can put Duran as the greatest. I mean, I've got Duran top five, but you, I've got Ali above him, and you can watch all of Ali's fights. So, yeah, exactly. I was going to say. I mean, I think what the what the questioner is getting at is the fact that well, you put know, it this way. Some, some of Sugar Ray Robinson's best fights were all at welterweight, and there's no welterweight Sugar, Sugar Ray Robinson on video. Yeah. Um, exactly. yeah. Harry, Harry Grabs because it's a top ten, mm-hmm. and there's not yeah, even there's a, no a stitch of his footage around about. But I'll tell you what, you know, I think if, if you're going to base it, I mean, people are going to be all oh, well, that was old school. Stuff. Think about Duran's lightweight days, right? This is a lightweight only. That alone would be enough to get him top 10, top 15 status of all time, I think. Because he basically had a whole career. That, 
you know, guys like Floyd Mayweather, for instance, he's gone up for his, he's had like 48, 49, 50 fights. Duran had something like 65 fights. Anyway, and they fought on <laughs> for about another 50 fights. <laughs> <laughs> Wankers. But anyways. <laughs> uh, next question. What have we got? What have we got? Daniel Stone. Put some mute your mics, lads. The version of Khan versus Brooke version versus Porter. Who wins, Donny? I mean, come on. I mean, I, I mean, look. Honestly, you're talking about. Look at what, what's the <laughs> <laughs> look. Look at the look at the resumes from last night, though. I mean, like now with Alexander on his resume, like Judah, Malinaji, Katelnik, Barrera. Uh, but I was shot the shit, man. You kind of put that fight in there. Well, I'm just, I'm just padding it a little bit, but, uh, but, mm. but I mean, uh, you know, you got, um, you know, Kalaza, decent, decent win. Uh, Maidana, obviously. I mean, you know, you're going through all of these wins, and like all Kell Brook has is one fight. I mean, yes, all right, he's champion. I get that. Like, you know, all right, he can stop. I mean, he can stop. He reminded us because we, we all, we can all go on ESPN and see who the four welterweight champions are of the world, but. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Khan is the is is honestly like I mean, he's been through, he's tested, and he's proven, and he seems to be coming into uh, a kind of second prime here, uh, a smarter, more deadlier version. The speed is, you know, he hasn't lost any of the speed moving up in weight. That was the thing that made Pacquiao so dangerous was that he was able to climb all those weight classes without losing the speed. And uh, now that Amir's really filled out. Um, I mean, I think that uh, the sky's the limit for him. I think, I think actually Porter's the more dangerous fight because he can actually get inside people and and rough you up on the inside. And so I think if Brooke Brooke doesn't like to fight inside too much either, and if you want to stay on the outside with Khan, he'll he'll, he'll pick pick you apart all day. So um, so I think Khan beats Brooke. I think he has more trouble with Porter. Alex in the mix is asking, do you see the big UK fights happening this time with Lee? Saunders, Murray, possibly even Eubank after the Barker Macklin era didn't materialise. Orly Joshua. Oh God. <laughs> I think there's going to be more opportunities for it. I think there's less egos on the show, and the fact that there's already a belt in the mix now, and voluntaries will be enforced and things like that, just makes sense to make them beforehand. It was all a lot of grandstanding. It was all waiting for. Uh, you know, the, the middleweights especially is waiting for all of them just to make a stand at middleweight and then they'd hold cards and then they'd dictate to the others and then it all just fell apart because of, you know, egos, inactivity and things like that. But I think now we're definitely going to see a few more. Kurt, what would, uh, this one comes from, from Mickey D, he's asking, what would you guys prefer to see first, Can Brook or Mayweather Can? Personally, I'd rather see the Mayweather Khan fight. To be honest, the other the other fight's a good fight, but I just think you know to see a British fighter win with Floyd. I mean, remember the last time we've had, and you know, obviously it's not going to be the same kind of event, but you know, to see him win with the best guy in the world, you know, a British fighter, I think that's a, a great event, and it's a g- great for the British boxing because you know the media over here will be really covering it, and it'll be good for the sport over here, and it's also a really interesting fight, I think. Steve uh, Daz Brown's asked, does Khan have enough power at one four seven? Well, it's early days. Um, well, I asked the question earlier, would he have the power to hurt Thurman? I'm I'm not convinced he does have the power at this weight. I think it's more speed and timing and wearing you down. I think if he had the true power, he maybe would have knocked Alexander down last night. Although saying that, Alexander's always had a pretty resilient beard on him. He's not the type of go- guy to go down easily. So it's, it remains to be seen. Um, you know, speed kills, I suppose. So it doesn't matter if he's got the one-punch power or not. He's got the speed and the timing and... Still the same flaws, but well, I, d- I don't think so. But I'm there to be convinced. It's it's like I don't think Devon is a good example because, like um, Steve said, he he has got a good chin. I mean, he took some good shots last night, and he's took some good shots in his other fights. But I think you know, I mentioned earlier, Tim Bradley's a clear example. You know, the guy's got no power really. But you know, if if you're good enough, you're going to be up there. You know, you don't. It's not the be all and end all. You know, Khan's not a, a feather fisted guy. You know, like Bradley isn't. You know, they I think they got enough to get people's respect, and especially with you know when you put Khan's speed into the mix. You know, he's got uh, more than enough to get people's respect. He's, he's not going to, you know, I don't think he's going to land on someone's chin and, you know, spark them out like someone else would, like Keith Furman would, I suppose. But he's still got enough there to 
to do well, I think. He has the speed of punch to get to the target. I mean, look at the body shot he landed against Madonna, you know, nearly crippled him in two. So I think definitely the speed is, you know, of getting, getting hitting you first before, you know, might knock somebody out. Uh, Andrew Lee Evans, second last question before the Bell of the Week segment. Donny, Lee's right hook or Garcia's left hook? Which one will be the most feared in 2015? P.S. Can Schoolsbrook? <laughs> P.S. You're wrong. Uh, but anyways, uh, I think um, but so, left so, hook. So, I mean, so, wait a minute, so, so, so Brook, <laughs> Brook schools can. Is that right? Oh, oh, oh he's, he agreed. Oh, I thought he was trolling me. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't hear the question. <laughs> no. Um. Yeah. No. All right. I like this guy. All right. Anyways. Uh, I, I think yeah, Garcia's left hook is obviously going to be more fearsome. Because, I mean, if you were Rod Selka on the other end of that thing, how would you feel? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I guess it determines, uh, it depends upon the, the quality of the opponents that, um, you know, each person's going to face. Uh, Andy Lee, if he uh, goes back, what you said, next, the next fight for him is Saunders. Uh, that's going to be good. That, I mean, he's certainly going to be a tough, I mean, you know, Chris Eubanks uh, Jr. gave him a run for his money and... Um, I think Andy Lee is uh, a whole lot more um, experienced and skilled than Eubank Jr. Uh, and um, you know, I, I think I think Andy Lee may well knock him out. Uh, and if Saunders can come through that, that'll be a major uh, maturing experience for him, and uh, that'll show that um, he's really at world level. And finally, the last question from from first class boxing: Julie Leatherman or C.G. Ross? Who needs spec savers more? I think there's without question. It's, uh, well, she's no longer a judge now, but C.G. Ross definitely. She's has some, she, she already got specs as well, I believe. But she, <laughs> had, a, she was one deplorable <laughs> judge. She was one deplorable judge. I don't think you guys are going to dis- dispute that. Being nope. the case, Kurt, mate, hit the intro button for you know what for what you know what's next. I've only got one, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, what's the value of the week? It's gonna happen, mate, we're gonna do it. And when we do it, it it's gonna be vicious, mate. I ain't a man dregsing with the weights. I ain't a man taking the last ounces of my soul on the scales. I've done that before, I ain't doing it no more. You can say what you want, oh, Bellew's not in shape, Bellew looks fleshy at the weight. Bellew's just iced a man who's never been done before. Bellew just feels in absolutely fantastic shape. Bellew doesn't lose two and a half stone no more each time for the camp. Bellew goes to the gym now, 15 stone, and just cuts 10 pound, nice and easy. I fought Nathan Cleverly in my 16th fight, 15 fight novice. I had four, the best person I fought was Oval McKenzie at British title level. I am now, is that 25, is that 26 fight? I fought some of the best, I fought the best the best fighter in the world in my weight class, one of the biggest pound for pound punches in the world. I've beat guys like Isaac Chalemba, world ranked guys. Let's see who beats Isaac Chalemba. I've beat renowned punches, Edison Miranda. I'm not saying who's the best Edison Miranda. I'm just saying I've beat these guys. Who's he beat? Okay, everyone's saying, well, Tony, he did beat you. He beat a guy who basically got a fight because he opened his mouth at a press conference and he shit sells, sells a shit all the tickets to the Echo Arena. That's why I got that fight. Everybody thought he was going to smash me. Everyone involved with that fight thought he was going to smash me. But when he went to within an inch of losing, and it's a decision that could have went either way, he doesn't want to come near me after it. That's why he couldn't answer the question then when I said it in front of him. Just answer me this, why wouldn't you take the rematch immediately? Do you know what he said? I think he was saying what that Walsh chain station was. That long word. I couldn't understand what he was saying. I just answered the simple question. Why wouldn't you fight me? The minute after the rematch happened, he wouldn't fight me because he, he, he believed he was going to knock me out and he just believed he was going to beat me up. And that's all I've got to say about that. Let's do it right now. Now you fucking rat. Okay, what's the value of the week? What's the bell of the week? Well, it's just about to start, and here we have the very first nomination. Did anybody catch this? I didn't read the full quote, but Polly Malay Nagy during the week. There, now, this guy's either drunk, on drugs, or he's had, you know, the beaten to porters basically damaged his brain. And he says, now, quote, honestly, I would beat Manny Pacquiao right now, so imagine what Floyd does to him. I can space cadet. 
That's that's. Um, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I do like Paulie since he came in to commentate, and I do like him when he's talking. But I just think he's a bit of a a Showtime slash Al Heyman company man when it comes to those type of fights. So I just take it with a pinch of salt, to be honest. He, he he's a big fan of Mayweather, you can tell, and. You got know, a real axe to grind against Pacquiao, hasn't he? Yeah, he's, he's mentioned Pacquiao about the the PEDs as well. I mean, I, I don't know where it all comes from, but I just, you know, I like him when he's commentating on the fights, but when when in interviews on his own, I don't really pay much attention. Yeah, when when um, <clears throat> he he's had a thing though even before he only became a uh, affiliation with uh, Showtime and Al Heyman and everything like that, and, and you know, in the past maybe year or so or a year and a half, but I mean, he's been hating on Pacquiao since. What maybe yeah. 08, 09, Like I mean, that that hatred goes way back. Now I don't know what the source of it is. Like you said, but he, he definitely like has something an axe to grind with that man. There's there's something that uh, that must have poisoned that relationship. I don't know. Yeah, and this one comes from this nomination goes to the Australian Boxing Legends magazine. Thanks to Daniel O'Sullivan for sending this one in. Now, what it is, it's the front cover of their magazine, right? And it's got Australian boxing legends, and it's got a picture of Anthony Mundine landing in the right uppercut against Sergei Rabchenko. And at the bottom, you've got a picture of Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather, and, it, and the quote is this, Man in the middle. Now, the man, obviously, is, his, is Mundine's nickname. The man in the middle. Mundine and Mayweather Pacquiao mix. Can we post it in the mix of the chat so everyone can have a good yes. look at this? Because you need, you really need to see this. Yep. Here we are. <laughs> just fire it in there. Just Fantastic. Like, there you go. I've said it about the Aussies before. They they don't care. They don't care what <laughs> people think. They don't hide their bias. They they want their men to do well, and they don't give t- a shit what anyone thinks. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they are they are funny for that. I mean, you always remember the um, Roy Jones Danny Green fight. I mean, the, the whole to become a legend, you got to beat a legend. I mean, they just don't care. Next one goes to Joe Gallagher, you know, Mr. I've got a lot to say for myself. Um, he's talking about the Abraham Smith rematch, which I think has been signed for February 21st. This fight will go no more than six or seven rounds. Oh, he shouldn't be so harsh on Paul there. Abraham yeah. might let, take him late. Oh. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> Fourth one goes to Oscar De La Hoya, right? And he's on the comment of Amir Khan. Donnie's not going to love this. He's not going to like this one, but he's just... He's, <laughs> Khan can be one of the best of all time. Right? He says, Amir still can give a lot of trouble to Mayweather and he could do the same to Pacquiao as well. He's been promised the likes of Mayweather and Pacquiao and it hasn't yet happened. After his fight against Devin Alexander, I would really love to put Amir in with the very best and that means either Mayweather or Pacquiao because that's what he deserves. The time is now for him. He deserves to fight Mayweather or Pacquiao. That's when, that's when we see the very best of Amir Khan. Amir is at the perfect moment in his career the time is right for him, and we're pushing very hard for those fights. Is he, if he gets he's the fight with his... Mayweather, we're going to hear about the blueprint again, aren't we? Yeah, he's back on the ching again, I think, Mr. De La Hoya. The... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the yeah, no, I was... I like, can I get, put a, a, an honourable mention nomination in here for, for De La Hoya's beard? Well, he, look, he looks like <laughs> ridiculous with that thing. Well, he looks like he rolled out of bed and he said, like, oh, I think I'll go like promote a fight. He looks day. like a hobo. He did. He rolled out of bed, got his mirror and his $20 bill, snorted, and then just went to the fights. <laughs> <laughs> with his fishnets on. I was actually... The, I'd uh, seen this quote last night uh, on BoxRec and I was going to put up the WBO as a nomination but I think I maybe need to remove them because I read that they'd sanctioned the fight between Blake Capolero and Max Maximilino Jorge Gomez for some WBO regional title fight for a nine-rounder. And I actually, uh, someone corrected it and then I seen BoxRec had actually been updated to, it was actually a ten-rounder fight but they've still haven't, quote, they've still haven't fixed up the... Uh, you know, the wee tab for, like, comments and stuff like that uh, next to the fight, so that's still in there. So we'll withdraw the WBO, but Alex, I think you've also got a nomination, quite a good one this week, reserved to Mr. Nick Holland. Yeah, Nick Holland made a, a late entry just before we went live. Um, he knew he was coming live, so he had to get his act. Yeah. Um, it goes here, given Quigg's injury, the Frampton fight looks way off. Maybe it's time to put the case for Frampton versus Kid Galahad. The kid wins it for me. <laughs> no bias there from no, no bias. bias. There's, there's no company agenda there. Eh? Nope. <laughs> He's his own man, straight talking. Yep. But Quig is levels and levels above Kid, Kid Galahad, remember? But Kid Galahad could easily beat Frampton. 
Donny, Steve, Kurt, you've got any nominations this week? No, I no. can't think of any. Nothing for me. No. you got nothing, Donny, so that says we've got Nick Holland, we've got Joe Gallagher, the Australian Boxing Magazine, Oscar De La Hoya, or Polly Malik Nagy. My vote's got to go to the Australians, actually. Yeah, I mean, any other time, I mean, you'd, you'd have to put Malinaji in there, but this is a this is a weird circumstance where something has topped it, and that Australian magazine, that's got to be up there. <laughs> just the graphics of it, too. I mean, you just really have to see it, but the man in the middle, like, I just, the <laughs> wordplay, just... the graphics, the whole fucking thing. I love, I, just... the, I love the top bit, Lucas Brown versus Tyson Fury, super fight. <laughs> I just, I just imagine some Australian boxing fans picking up the magazine off the shelf and thinking, "Yes, he's in with a chance of Floyd." <laughs> <laughs> it's eight dollars as well, isn't it? Or something? Fuck it, so. Steve, Alex, Donny, who, who are you voting for? Uh, I, yeah, I gotta give it to uh, us. Was it Australian Boxing Monthly? <laughs> something like that. Australian Boxing Legends magazine. Uh, le- legends. <laughs> <laughs> Danny Green's in there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going for the Australian magazine. I was hoping it was going to be the old Australian fight magazine, Fist magazine. <laughs> but, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that, that one's even going in for. <laughs> Alex, you've got the final vote, mate. Seven is, for that shit. Is, it, is it going to be a, a whitewash this week, Alex? Are you going to vote for Australians? I, I was teetering towards uh, Paulie because he has been a bit of a knob lately, but we might as well give it a whitewash to the Australian Boxing Legends magazine. Australian Boxing Legends magazines. <laughs> well done, lads. You well are done, now Mike. the champion. <laughs> I mean, the Aussies have really popped themselves this time, you know. We just, got, we just got to say as well, to become a legend, you have to win a value of the week, and they've done that. They've done that, yep. They've done Was that. that crowd from a mundane fight? <laughs> he, has, he only has 27 in attendance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. Um, yeah, well, guys, as you know, um, well, just let the listeners know, next Sunday will be our last podcast of the year. Um, now, we'll be doing the end of year show next week as well, so there's not really much boxing to discuss next week. We've got a decent wee fight coming up in Argentina between Juan Carlos Rovecchio and Jod Makovo or Sangfet, which is for the WBA regular uh, flyweight title fight. Should be a decent enough wee scrap, but uh, the car from Canada guys is looking pretty decent, actually. Baterbev back in action, Jojo Dan against Kevin Bizier, I think might be a decent enough wee, wee scrap. Your favourite in the main event? And uh, Duck Onis, Avoid Onis, Stevenson against Dimitri was it Shukotsky. I hope he gets spat the fuck out. Have I said any derogatory towards him recently? Not recently. This this should be a question of who'd rather get sparked out worse, Browner or Stevenson? Hmm. Um, I've got to see Stevenson's got to get knocked out. I want to see him get just sparkled. It's just, you know... I don't want to see him get that big payday anymore, especially against the likes of Kovalev. Uh, so that's really it, guys. Uh, that's the, the only action we've got next week. Um, as I say, as well, I think we're going to try and get Kevin, sorry, no Kevin, Kyle McLaughlin on next week. I think we're going to try and do our top five British fighters of all time. So, Donnie, you better start doing your research, mate. All right. Um, eh? I've already done it. He's done it. Amir Khan's number one. Amir Khan, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Uh, as I say, we'll, we'll cover our, our fights of the year, which will be very, very brief. Knockouts of the year, fighter of the year, prospect of the year, all that stuff as well. So, I'll say anything else you guys want to add in. I think we're running just over two hours to, uh, today. Um, I think we should have a best calendar of the year, which I think Audley Harrison deserves a mention. <laughs> <laughs> God. Audley fucking Harrison. I say, he's another one who needs to get put, put to sleep to go to end the retirement, actually. Do my tits in. He's getting edited out. Yep. Anyways, guys, I'd like to thank you all for being on. Donnie Baseball, Alex Morris, Steve Wellens, Kurt Ward, I've been your host, Andy Patterson. As I says, we'll see you next Sunday. It'll be the final year end review show. And I think after that, we'll be back on probably the 11th of January. So, about a fortnight off after that. So, we'll see you next week and all the best. Cheers. Carl Froch, not top 10 pound fan. Cock most to what? Matt.